for the ones of you in the audience that I may not personally know, I'm Dr. Thais Coutinho. I'm a cardiologist, vascular medicine specialist, and clinician scientist here at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. I'm also chair of the Canadian Women's Heart Health Centre and uh, chief of the Division of Cardiac Prevention and Rehabilitation. I see, I think it's fair to say that I see all the SCAD patients that the Heart Institute sees these days. So I have really had a lot of um, experience with patients like Dawn and others. Uh, and my talk today is really an introductory talk for the ones of you in the audience who may not be as acquainted with the topic of SCAD. It's really a very uh, superficial but global overview of epidemiology, pathophysiology, and some clinical features. And after this very uh, global overview, then we're going to go into the uh, more in-depth pieces of the workshop uh, that go in more detail about diagnosis management and after and, and post-acute care. So without further ado, so my talk topic today is what is SCAD? So um, I have no disclosures for this talk. And SCAD, which stands for Spontaneous Coronary Artery Dissection, as you may know, uh, is what the name says. is a spontaneous separation of one of the layers of the coronary artery wall from the other two. And that separation is not iatrogenic. You know, it's not because you put a catheter in there and dissected it, and it's not related to trauma. So really spontaneous. So that is SCAD. And before we go on into the talk, I wanted to highlight to all of you in the audience some important um, uh, papers that you can actually read to really deepen your knowledge. So back in 2018, there were two position statements that were published, the European one and the American one. They're excellent documents, very easy reads. And, and since then, there has been an excellent state-of-the-art review co-authored by one of our speakers today, Dr. Marisha Tweet. Marisha will be quoting a lot of your papers today. Um, and I think that this um, uh, state of the art review from Jack, it's a real good complement to the position statements because it updates you on some new data that wasn't available when the position statements were written. So I wanted to leave that up front for you in terms of resources uh, if you wish to go back home today and read uh, a little bit more about SCAD. So let's talk about SCAD mechanism. So the coronary arteries, just like any artery, has three layers, as you know, the, the uh, intima, the media, and the adventitia. And there have been two proposed mechanisms as to how a SCAD happens. One mechanism is shown here on the top right, which uh, demonstrates that the inciting event may be a tear to the intima, and that tear allows blood to seep in from the lumen of the vessel into this false lumen that gets created within the wall of the artery, creating a hematoma that eventually compresses the true lumen. Then the other potential theory for the pathophysiology of SCAD is rather the fact that the inciting event may not be a tear, but rather be a spontaneous bleeding into the wall of the artery. And in some patients, the uh, tear may be a secondary event. So at the time of uh, that this review by Dr. Jackie Saw from UBC was written in 2016, I think there was enough, uh, uh, I shouldn't say confusion, but still enough doubt about which of these mechanisms were the correct one, but since then, I think there have been enough evidence to suggest that the bottom here, uh, the bottom mechanism may in fact be the one that is predominantly more uh, more uh, or more commonly found in SCAD patients. So we now tend to believe that the majority of patients likely start with this spontaneous bleeding. There have been studies from our colleagues at Mayo Clinic that have taken patients with SCAD that had disease progression, they had chest pain and were taken back to the cat lab. And it was interesting that some patients that did not have a tear on their first angiogram did have a tear on the subsequent angiogram. So there's some thought that perhaps it starts with the bleeding, and then in some patients, the tear is a mechanism for the artery to kind of vent off some of that pressure that is being created in this false lumen into the wall and release some of that pressure. And it's possible that the tear may indeed be a secondary event. It, it could possibly be a primary event in some people, but most likely uh, the spontaneous bleeding into the wall is the predominant mechanism in most. And here are a gross pathology specimen on the left and a histopathology specimen on the right from patients who unfortunately did not survive their SCAD. So on the left, the gross pathology, you can very easily see this coronary here, and you can see how the uh, layers of the wall separated by this huge uh, hematoma here in the false lumen, which squished the true lumen. And the same is seen here in the histopathology slide on the right, where you can see that the media separated 
isolated from the adventitia and created this huge thrombus into the uh, wall of the artery, creating a false lumen that also squished the true lumen. And how much the lumen is squished will, will, will determine how much the blood flow is impaired down to the myocardium and will also determine the duration and the size of the uh, myocardium function. In terms of epidemiology, I started off this workshop today by telling you that SCAD is not rare, and I firmly believe it. I, you know, if you do a clinic with me in half a day, I would see six or seven SCAD patients back to back. So SCAD is not rare, but it, we may not be perfectly primed yet to find it in all of the patients. So the true incidence and prevalence of SCAD are likely still underreported because there are significant challenges in sometimes recognizing the patient and even doing an ECG on a SCAD patient all the way to identifying minor findings on an angiogram that may represent a SCAD. So with, with this caveat in mind, it has been reported that two to four percent of all acute coronary syndromes are related to a spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And in fact, if you look at women who are 50 years of age or younger, SCAD is actually the cause of myocardial infarction in over a third of them. So once again, SCAD is not rare. Uh, it, it's very, from an epidemiology perspective, there's a very interest, interesting pattern here because the far majority of SCAD patients are women. Over 90% uh, of reported cases occur in women. Average age between 44 and 53, however, it can really affect all age groups as I'm going to show you next. And another interesting uh, piece of the epidemiology of this condition or, or the features of a patient with this condition is that so many SCAD patients have very few or sometimes no traditional cardiovascular risk factors whatsoever. Very often, they don't have the usual things that we think about when we think of a heart attack patient, such as diabetes, smoking, hypertension. Sometimes they do, but many of them are free of traditional risk factors or have very few of them. In terms of age, uh, we used to think, you know, a, a little while ago that SCAD was a disease of young women. And sure enough, it can affect young women. But what we have learned from the Canadian SCAD registry shown here and also many other registries around the world is that the average age of a SCAD patient is about 50 to 53 years old. So not as young as initially thought, however, still younger than the average quote, bread and butter atherosclerotic heart attack patient. And as you can see here in this slide, really SCAD can affect any age group. Personally, I have patients all the way from 20 into their late 70s, uh, but certainly the average age seems to hover around that 50. And every time I get a call from the hospital uh, to see a SCAD patient, I always ask the residents, like, What's the underlying condition? What's the precipitating factor? I always like to think of SCAD as a marriage of an underlying condition that may make that patient more likely to dissect with a precipitating factor that incited that event. Sometimes you don't find the underlying condition or the precipitating factor, but sometimes you do, many times you do. So it's very important that you ask, and I call this the SCAD math, that SCAD is the marriage of, or the summation of an underlying condition with a precipitating factor. And here are some reported underlying conditions on the left. I put a star here on the ones that we tend to see most often. Certainly fibromuscular dysplasia or FMD, which is a congenital um, abnormality of the structural architecture of arteries, and it can affect the coronaries, and they may render these arteries more likely, uh, more likely to dissect or form an aneurysm or even stenosis, depending on the arterial bed. Fibromuscular dysplasia is found in about 50% of patients with SCAD, and it's something that we should consider searching for uh, as an underlying condition. Other underlying conditions, uh, which I, I guess you can also call it a precipitating factor, are pregnancy-related timings, and we'll talk a little bit later about pregnancy-associated SCAD, and also hormonal therapy. Now, there are other precipitating conditions or underlying conditions such as Marfan syndrome, Ellis Dunlos, systemic inflammatory diseases, that can certainly predispose a patient. However, in, in real practice, we don't find these so often. From the many dozens, if not hundreds, of patients of SCAD that I personally follow, I feel like I have one or two with a connective tissue disorder and one or two with a systemic inflammatory disease. These are possible, but not that common. Uh, on the precipitating factor, I always try to understand what 
made the SCAD happen. And in men, the most common precipitating factor will be intense exercise. And in women, the most common precipitating factor will be emotional stress, although men and women can have either of these things. And the other precipitating factor is pregnancy, labor and delivery. Uh, and then there are other things that are less commonly seen, such as recreational drugs, um, intense hormonal therapy, and etc. So always ask so you can understand why this happened to your patient. Uh, look, another a few words about FMD. Um, Bef until last year, I used to tell our patients with SCAD that we should search for FMD for a couple of reasons. One, uh, to help close the loop, right? To help really understand why is it that this patient had a SCAD? And then we find the FMD and then you say, oh, okay, now I understand. So that in itself, it's helpful. Then the reason also that we look for FMD is because FMD can harbor some hidden aneurysms or hidden dissections that you should be monitoring from that point on. So here, for example, in the panel C here, you have aneurysms of the internal carotid arteries or right at the bone. Uh, you can also see little dissections. Here in panel E, you have a small dissection of an iliac artery, or you may also see the classic findings of FMD, but mostly we look for FMD to make sure we don't have an aneurysm or a pseudoaneurysm somewhere that is hidden that we should be following. And I have certainly found my share of aneurysms and pseudoaneurysms that way. And most recently, as of 2022, uh, the UBC group published their most recent evaluation from the Canadian SCAD registry, and they found that the presence of FMD was an independent risk factor for recurrence of events and recurrence of SCAD uh, in the longer term, and I, I think it was a three-year follow-up. So now I have that as another reason why we should search for FMD, because it may also highlight to you a patient who could be at higher risk of recurrence. Now, in terms of the phenotype of a SCAD patient, there have been other papers most recently. They all seem to be published by Dr. Tweet. Uh, there are more a few patient papers more recently that have helped us characterize the phenotype of a SCAD patient a little bit better. On the top, you see here the relationship with migraines. Now, migraines are very common in the whole population. However, if you look at the population of SCAD patients and then you compare that to the general population, um, migraines are more prevalent among SCAD patients. And interestingly, in this Mayo Clinic cohort, they found that the presence of migraines are also associated with a greater likelihood of having FMD in other arterial beds. So that's an interesting association. So since then, the publication of this article, I always ask my patients about their history of migraines. And I also added to this about asking about history of Raynaud's, which migraines and Raynaud's are both diseases of vascular motor dysregulation. And when we ask, we also find that a number of patients have a history of Raynaud's as well. The other interesting phenotypic characterization that have also been uh, published by the Mayo Clinic is this concept of cataminio angina. And I have to say that before this paper uh, by Dr. Tweet and the colleagues, we had heard this before, the patients thought they were crazy, the doctors thought the patients were crazy, but when this publication came out, it all makes sense. And we see this so often among our SCAD patients who are in reproductive age and still menstruating. So the cataminio angina is very commonly seen after SCAD in this uh, younger uh, women with SCAD group. And it's characterized as true angina occurring one to two days before their menses up to the day of the menses. And I have to say that now that I pay attention to this, I have had patients that have had their first SCAD and their recurrent SCAD on the perimenstrual period as well. Um, in uh, the Mayo Clinic experience, a number of them had abnormal stress test. Personally, I have not found that many, and we do PET here quite often to get some other pieces of, um, of functional information about the, the flow uh, in the coronaries. Uh, we haven't found many abnormal stress tests, but importantly, only a minority of these patients with true angina had persistent obstruction. The majority of them will have angina despite the arteries having healed and being fully open. So this concept of cataminio angina is something that you should be attentive to because it will pop up often and the patient is not crazy. And in fact, they can recur even in the cataminio period. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, the, uh, in terms of SCAD symptoms, SCAD really presents a, very often as your classic textbook heart attack. The very majority of patients will present with chest pain, but I also wanted to highlight that a small number 
uh, or a small proportion of patients, about 7% may present with sudden cardiac death with VT or VF. So this is not a perfectly benign condition and some can present in cardiac arrest, but the majority of them will present with chest discomfort, which is often very classic in textbook. Here are some other features of the SCAD presentation. Uh, the, the, all of the patients present with an acute coronary syndrome as Dawn has illustrated to us in the beginning of this uh, panel. Um, about a quarter of patients will present with a ST elevation MI, so a STEMI, and then the rest will present with uh, non-STEMI or, uh, or non-STEMI type of ACS. Um, in terms of precipitating factors, I had already mentioned earlier that the majority of patients have an emotional stress uh, as a precipitating factor. However, a quarter of patients will have a, a, a significant physical exertion as a precipitating factor. Now, in terms of additional characterization of the clinical presentation of SCAD patients, uh, this is a study that looked at patients that had STEMI due to SCAD, which is shown in blue, versus a STEMI not due to SCAD, the usual atherosclerotic STEMI, which is shown in red. And uh, what they found is that um, SCAD was the culprit in 1% of all STEMIs. Uh, and however, if you look at patients who were 50 or younger, about 20% with STEMI, 20% uh, of the patients with STEMI in that age group uh, actually had SCAD as a culprit. And it's quite interesting to see the differences because uh, among patients that have a STEMI due to SCAD, they are much more likely to be women. They are much more likely to have a left main as a culprit for their STEMI. And perhaps as a result of that, they're also much more likely to present in cardiogenic shock. But despite these ominous presenting features, at the three-year follow-up, the survival was better among the uh, SCAD STEMI patients as compared to the atherosclerotic STEMI patients. A few words about pregnancy-associated SCAD. Um, so this is, I think, classically how most people think about SCAD. I think they think of a, a pregnant woman with a acute coronary syndrome, and we certainly see this not infrequently. Uh, but in terms of the timing uh, of the uh, pregnancy-associated SCAD is very well represented here in this graphic. It can happen pretty much any time during pregnancy or postpartum, but the far majority of patients are going to present in the first five weeks postpartum, and especially the very first week postpartum, shown here in red. I recently saw a patient that presented in the 38th week, but other than that, all of my other pregnancy scare patients have presented in the first five weeks postpartum, sometimes up to three months. But this is something to, to think about if you see a pregnant woman late, in late pregnancy or early postpartum period with chest pain, SCAD should be in your mind. And be aware of pregnancy-associated SCAD. Pregnancy-associated SCAD is a more ominous SCAD. If I ever get a phone call about a SCAD patient who is an ECMO, a SCAD patient who uh, has gone through a cabbage or uh, has even required a transplant, so often I can predict that that was a pregnancy-associated SCAD. Again, in this study from our colleagues at the Mayo Clinic, they compared the pregnancy-associated SCAD patients on the left with the non-pregnancy SCADs on the right. And as you can see, a pregnancy-associated SCAD patient was more, much more likely to present with a STEMI. They were more likely to present with a reduction in the left ventricular ejection fraction because they had a bigger heart attack. Uh, they were much more likely to have left main or multi-vessel SCAD as culprits, which is, of course, much more dangerous. And they were also more likely to require a vascularization, either percutaneously or surgically. And perhaps as a result of all these things, at the end of a four-year follow-up, the patients with pregnancy-associated SCAD were left with a lower ejection fraction, again, because of their larger heart attacks. So when you see pregnancy-associated pregnancy SCAD, beware these tend to be more severe cases. And since we're talking about pregnancy, I thought I should also have a slide about sex hormones and SCAD. And this is something that, in my opinion, it's still a bit nebulous, and I would love to be able to discuss this with our experts and the panel in the end. But obviously, SCAD is a disease of women for the most part. So the usual assumption is that female sex hormones have to have a role in it, right? So it just kind of makes sense uh, intuitively. But uh, the uh, uh, arguments against it that have been proposed by our colleagues at Mayo Clinic is that, well, SCAD can happen to any women, nulliparous, pregnant, postpartum, multiparous, or postmenopausal. So there's no 
common hormonal factor here for all these women. There has been no conclusive evidence about the use of exogenous hormones and the occurrence of SCAD, and there's no different utilization of oral contraceptives in the SCAD population compared to the general population. So they argue here that the role of sex hormone in SCADs are not as obvious as one may think. My anecdotal experience, which I have put here in the bottom, uh, which is something that I've been thinking quite a bit of, uh, about, is that I think it may not be the hormones with themselves, but rather with the withdrawal of the hormones. We have certainly seen women have SCAD in the postpartum period, which is when your sex hormone levels go from here to here really quickly. We have had women develop SCAD in the perimenopausal time. We have had women develop SCAD when they change from uh, oral um, hormone replacement therapy to uh, uh, vaginal cream, which is a lot less absorbed. And a week later, they have gone on to have SCAD. We have seen women have had SCAD when they started uh, tamoxifen therapy for breast cancer. So it just I, I just get the flavor personally of the story of the hormonal withdrawal rather than hormonal administration in a way. So this is a theory of mine. It's not written anywhere. I would love to get everybody's opinion about that later. And again, uh, we uh, wanted to finish off since we're talking about sex-based things or hormonal things. Uh, just a couple of words about SCAD in men. Uh, you know, we talk about SCAD not being rare, but SCAD in men is rare. I think I follow five patients that are men. The far majority of others uh, are women. Uh, but men with SCAD have a few interesting differences. They tend to be younger than women with SCAD. They are more likely to have exertional precipitating factors, so heavy exercise, as compared to women who most often have emotional stressor as a precipitating factor. And women, men were also slightly more likely to have used recreational drugs as a precipitating factor for SCAD, and they're less likely than women to have fibromuscular dysplasia. So with that, uh, I'll finish here with this global overview with some take home points, that SCAD is not as rare as previously assumed, we may not just not be looking for it uh, as much as we should. 90% uh, of SCAD patients are women with an average age of 53, but it can really affect all ages, and we need to have a high suspicion for diagnosis from the emergency room all the way to the cat lab. Think of SCAD as a marriage of a predisposing condition with a trigger and always look for these. Uh, and the way I think about SCAD is a classic myocardial infarction presentation in a non-classical patient. So think about that for a moment. The presentation is classic, but the patient is not the usual prototype of a heart attack patient. Chest pain is most certainly the, com the most common symptom in a quarter of these patients who present with the STEMI. Always beware of pregnancy-associated SCAD, which is a more ominous form of SCAD. And remember that SCAD in men in is rare but can occur and is most commonly precipitated by strenuous physical exertion. So with that, I would end here. And again, we'll be saving questions for the end of the panel today. So thank you so much for your attention. And let me just unshare my screen so I can move on to our next presenter. Um, the next presenter will be my colleague, Dr. Derek So. Uh, he'll be talking to us about the diagnostic algorithm for SCAD, includes, including the invasive imaging and when to revascularize a patient with SCAD. Dr. So is an interventional cardiologist here at the Heart Institute and a full professor of medicine at the University of Ottawa. He is a program director for our adult interventional cardiology program, and he's a clinician investigator, very prolific one, if I may say, if I can say so, uh, with a research interest in antiplatelet therapies, acute coronary syndromes, and cardiogenic shock. Dr. So is always the go-to person I ask when I have a question about an angiogram, is it scared or not? He's the one that always has the answer for me. So thank you, Dr. So, for your time and your expertise today. Thank you, Thais. Um, you guys can hear me? Yes, I can. I can hear perfectly. OK, perfect. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity. I think this is a great endeavor that we're doing today. And certainly, I think it goes hand in hand in terms of both from a physician and from our patient advocates point of view that it's a very important topic that we have the opportunity to discuss. Um, so what I'm going to go through in the next 20 minutes is really the diagnostic algorithm from an interventional cardiology point of view what goes through our minds when we're encountering a patient possibly with SCAD, 
um, and the different techniques that we have in the CAF lab, both from an imaging point of view and also from an intervention point of view um, and how we go through this process. Um, the following are my disclosures. Most of these are not pertaining to today's topic at hand, but of course, as an interventionalist, some of the things that we'll talk about are um, in uh, areas that I do have uh, research or uh, clinical interest in. Um, so I'm going to actually start off with a case. This is a patient I actually saw quite recently and is very vivid in my mind. She's a 72-year-old ex-smoker with a one and a half hour history of chest pain had really subtle ST elevations in her precordial leads of presentation. Um, and when we saw her at the STEMI base, she was still having ongoing chest pain. And we actually did a POCUS, so a bedside echocardiogram. Um, there was some mild hypokinesis uh, uh, that was quite global. And so this is a shot of her right coronary. And one of the things that comes to mind right away is that the artery is actually quite normal, but also tortuous. Um, and whenever we look at arteries, you always have to start thinking, um, why is someone that's presenting with an infarct having quite normal arteries on the other side? And unfortunately, with this very first shot on the left side, it is no longer normal. And I'm just going to draw your attention here. This is where the left anterior descending artery should be, and it's gone. Um, so at this point, I'm actually scrubbing out my uh, fellow had uh, been scrubbed doing the diagnostic case. And as I scrub in, and he takes his first shot after taking a guide catheter, and now there is panic in the room as the patient's pain suddenly got a lot worse. And what you see here, the artery is now completely gone, the left interdescending artery. And when we take another view, it actually looks like a bomb has gone off in the left main and the LED is completely gone as opposed to the first picture where the LED was actually present and partially paid up. So we're going to come back to the case later on. Um, I wanted to recognize uh, Jackie Saw, my colleague from Vancouver, and she, certainly she's been a pioneer uh, both in Canada and internationally in terms of SCAD research. And she carried out a cohort study uh, across uh, uh, North America, um, where this is the largest cohort of SCAD patients. And a lot of my presentation comes back to things that we learned as a result of that first phase of the CAN-SCAD study. So um, Thais already mentioned the spectrum of presentations, but I want to draw your attention, especially to the latter three parts that patients could present with high risk features in terms of cardiac arrest, going into cardiac shock, and even death. And within CANSCAT, this constitutes almost 7.6% of the population. Um, and inherently, when we see patients in the cath lab early on, it's very important for us to identify high risk features. Um, and really be able to address these patients that are at highest risk. So coming back to the historical aspect, um, and, and Thais had mentioned some of these things already, I want to draw your attention to a few things here from CANSCAD. What you see on the left-hand side is that 8.1% of these patients can present with a, a ventricular arrest. And when we look on the right side here, the majority of these patients are non-STEMI, but certainly, as Thais had mentioned, they could come in with a STEMI presentation. Um, coming back to that piece on the mechanism on which, uh, by which SCAD actually um, uh, occurs, um, the reason why, from an intervention point of view, it's important to consider is that when I show you or discuss therapies on how we actually address possible SCAD cases in the cath lab or other means of revascularization, it comes back to what is the underlying mechanism by this by which this occurs um, and also the location of where the SCAD has occurred. In terms of history, paramount for us is to really recognize and think SCAD before you even start the case. Um, and, and Thais has already gone through some of these associated uh, conditions, which we need to be uh, aware of. And any time we hear or think about these, we really need to heighten our awareness that uh, that this could be a patient with SCAD. Um, I've summarized a few of the things that I always warn my fellows about. Anytime you who think you've got a young woman on the table, 
um, someone that does not have a lot of traditional risk factors, when you start taking pictures of the contralateral artery and you don't see atherosclerotic plaque, peripartum uh, period, as uh, Tyson mentioned before, um, the presence of FMD, other connective tissue disease, um, and also the precipitant of all these. These are things that should go through our minds before we even get the patient onto the cath lab table. And from a diagnosis point of view, once we have that suspected SCAD patient, the key thing is to try and get that patient as early as possible to the cath lab. And one of the things that always concerns us is that the longer you treat medically with potential anticoagulants, starting people on P2I12, that actually might make things worse. And by having that early diagnosis, it actually might enable us to direct the proper treatment at these patients. So once we are at angiography, um, there are types of SCAD, and I'll go through the uh, subtypes in a second of what we see in the cath lab, that if it's very obvious based on angiography and type 1, type 2, and that SCAD diagnosis is confirmed, a lot of the times we stop. Sometimes it is more cryptic, and the lower panel here really uh, goes through a few other modalities which might help us both in and outside of the cath lab. So if there are proximal vessels involved, sometimes we might take patients off the table and follow them with uh, uh, CT angiograms. Um, one thing that could mimic SCAD would be coronary spasm. And so by giving intracoronary uh, nitroglycerin gently, um, sometimes we can clarify that this is actually not SCAD and that this is spasm as the underlying diagnosis. For sure, in uh, certain types of type 2, type 3 SCAD, sometimes we use intracoronary imaging, and I'll be briefly discussing that uh, in a bit. Uh, and of course, the uh, one thing to think about is that if we are suspicious that this could be SCAD, um, in certain subgroup of patients, we would consider bringing them back to the cath lab a few weeks down the road, um, and we'll, I will go specifically into how to select these patients. So in terms of the subtypes of SCAD, there are actually four subtypes, and often in the initial literature, they mention the first three types. So type one is probably the most obvious one. We actually see staining as we inject the arteries, um, and it's very uh, uh, evident and obvious, and often that diagnosis is made very quickly. I always tell my fellows, if you take one shot and you see type 1 SCAD, always think about stopping uh, rather than keep taking pictures because certainly we put, put the patient at increased risk by taking further pictures. Type 2 SCAD involves usually the middle and distal segments of coronaries, and as you see here, often there's an abrupt change in terms of the arterial caliber. They're often longer at greater than 20 millimeters. Um, and a lot of the times they could be actually smooth and narrow. Um, and that constitutes about two thirds of SCAD. What you see in panel A versus B is a patient that had an initial presentation of SCAD uh, and then a patient coming back for a follow-up angiogram, and you really appreciate the difference of what that artery is supposed to look like as compared to at the initial presentation when the patient had, had the SCAD effect. Type 3 is probably the most challenging, and what is shown here um, is essentially the lesion that often just looks like an atherosclerotic plaque lesion. It's usually shorter at 11 to 20 millimeters, um, and this constitutes between 5 to 10% of the cases that we see. Um, and often we might depend on coronary imaging. And what you see on the right hand side is uh, uh, optical coherence tomography images of a SCAD, where we actually see a uh, hematoma in the wall. Um, let me show you uh, an, another picture later on that's going to give you a better idea in terms of, of uh, the different subtypes and the actual underlying mechanism and how it accounts for the subtypes. So what you see here from the CANSTAT study is the distribution. So in CANSTAT, about a third of those patients are type 1. The majority, as I talked about, is type 2. And um, in the literature, again, between 5 to 10 percent are type 3 here. The one type that we often forget is actually type 4, and this is more recently described. And what it is is that sometimes that SCAT event can actually cause the distal vessel to occlude 
Um, and because of that, we sometimes don't think about that as a SCAD event, but if we do have that heightened suspicion and you bring that patient back, sometimes the vessel recanalizes. Uh, this is from a New England paper where they actually looked at the, uh, the four subtypes and what is the underlying mechanism. So that when type one of what you see here, that is that typical intermost tear, whereas types two and three is an intramural hematoma, and usually type four is that intramural hematoma has actually invaginated the vessel and has occluded the vessel entirely. The one other thing that we often forget about, but we should be doing is that after we've made the diagnosis and taking pictures of the coronaries is that on the way out, uh, sometimes we, we should think about taking pictures of the uh, kidneys and that might help that associated FMD diagnosis, but certainly this could be identified by other modalities. In terms of intracoronary imaging, we have two main types, intravascular ultrasound on this right-hand panel here, and then uh, on the left-hand side are uh, the OCT images. What you see here is actually intimal rupture. Um, and then on the panel B here, this is an intramural hematoma without an actual communication uh, uh, into the main vessel. The advantage of OCT is that it gives us better resolution. It could delineate both true and false lumens and intramural hematoma. Uh, but it does have poor penetration so that if you've got a large vessel, sometimes we might not actually see the edge of that hematoma. The other thing, of course, is that in order to do an OCT, we actually have to put dye and inject dye in the vessel. And the more pictures that we take, uh, we actually potentially increase the chance of an atrogenic uh, dissection uh, because the vessels are uh, at risk to begin with. So the next thing to ask is when will we actually consider revascularizing a SCAD? Um, and in purple here are indications. Uh, so the default should always be conservative therapy, but if that patient has ongoing chest pain, recurrent chest pain while in hospital, or having a second admission because of chest pain. And then the latter three here, patients that are in shock, patient with ventricular arrhythmia, uh, and patient with left, left main dissection, these are all high-risk groups in which we should consider some sort of revascularization. I'm going to move on to the next picture that really gives us a, a better illustration on, on the next steps. So again, the high-risk features that were shown in that last slide now brings us to say, if there are these high-risk features, we consider PCI or cabbage. In that left main patients, the majority of these patients usually have not just left main involvement, but also osteocircumflex and LED. And in that scenario, uh, usually bypass surgery would have to be the default. Um, in non-left main lesion, if it's something that potentially could be a fixed PCI, we would consider it. But again, the majority of patients by what we've found in the literature and have learned over the years should really be treated conservatively. However, in those with high-risk anatomy, we might think about bringing them back down the road for further angiography. Um, and for those patients with very current pain, we again might bring them back and at the point consider uh, how to intervene upon. So coming back to CANSCAD, when we look at the distribution, the majority of patients in CANSCAD were treated conservatively. Um, about 11% of those patients were treated by PCI and a small proportion by bypass surgery. I think one thing that always concerns me when I see this is that there were close to 2% of patients that were treated with thrombolytic therapy. Um, that, unfortunately, is the default at certain centers and also, of course, in a small a peripheral hospital so that if someone presents with an ST elevation infarct, uh, and they're more than uh, 80 kilometers away outside of our STEMI circle, that default would be um, uh, thrombolytic therapy. But again, it comes back to that if there's a strong pretest probability, um, I think it'd be wise nowadays for some of these peripheral hospitals to actually give us a call and discuss things before they consider lytic therapy in these patients. So why would we consider conservative therapy as the default? And one of the things is that PCI of SCAD uh, vessels is actually quite difficult. Sometimes we're not able to wire the true lumen. Um, by 
putting a wire down, we can actually propagate dissection. Um, and usually because of the extensive nature of the underlying disease is that we have to go quite long in terms of stenting. Uh, and that brings a risk in terms of stem thrombosis. And I'm going to show you some data in that in a second. So the other reason not to intervene is that when we look at the natural progression, and this is, again, data that's from the Vancouver group, where Jackie Saw had taken 156 patients with 182 lesions. And what they found was that almost 87% had some sort of angiographic healing. Um, and when they looked at it in terms of patients that had it after 30 days, 95% had spontaneous healing, really pushing that idea that conservative therapy should be the default in a large majority of patients. But when we do consider angiography and, and, and PCI or repeat angiography here, um, these might be patients with recurrent symptoms, that high-risk anatomy, um, but thinking about that we could follow these patients with CT and geography sometimes if they're in the proximal segments. So we do have to consider PCI, and this is from CANSCAD. Um, reasons that push us would be chest pain, ECG changes, um, or proximal dissections as the top number of reasons why we would go ahead. And there are some certain considerations. For sure, any time that we think this is a potential patient with SCAD, we take uh, ephemeral approach rather than radio approach, and it's actually been shown uh, by Jackie's group that taking radio approach increases the incidence of further iatrogenic dissection in SCAD patients. We take very care, uh, a lot of care in terms of choosing a gentle guide catheter uh, and not using automated injector by changing it to a hand injection. And when we do intervene, we have to think about using longer stents and this concept of staging our stenting so that we might tack up to two ends at, uh, outside of where this, the uh, initial SCAD is and then move towards the middle. Um, and especially if we're dealing with osteolesions, it will be actually opposite to what we actually do, which is to stent the proximal segments first to prevent propagation more proximally. So this uh, here on the right hand side, I'm just going to draw your attention to this is more technical from a PCI point of view based on the SCAD subtype. But the options in terms of from a PCI point of view, sometimes just a wire alone might help us recanalize the, uh, the lumen. We might do a plain old balloon angioplasty and not put in stents. Um, and cutting balloon, I'm going to show you some work on that on our next slide, uh, would be something to consider. And then this concept of sequential stenting, as I had described. So cutting balloon or scoring balloons are these special balloons that have either got blades here. So cutting balloon, as you inflate it, there are four little blades that cut into the vessel. Or scoring balloons is uh, essentially the spiral um, mesh, which you see here, that when we inflate that balloon, it actually scores the inside of the artery. So there's been small case series where they actually show potential benefits in terms of recanalizing the artery. Um, and certainly at every single interventional K uh, conference, uh, invariably there'd be someone showing their case of a success story using a cutting balloon. These should be avoided in large vessels such as left mains, uh, but it might help again restore flow so that if someone has less than Timmy 3 flow, you would use it. Um, we do gentle inflation, so we're not trying to open the vessel directly, but really to cut that hematoma more for types 2 and type 3 SCAD. Um, and the idea is to restore flow, and there is some data in terms of using do antiplatelet therapy after cutting balloons. When we actually look at SCAD, uh, our PCI outcomes in SCAD patients, it is discouraging. On that bottom panel here, to give you an idea that there are a substantial amount of patients where we only achieve partial success or are unsuccessful, and there is an increased risk in terms of stent thrombosis in this population simply because often we might be stenting a large uh, uh, or a long segment of territory. Some of that might be within the false lumen. We're undersizing. Those are all reasons why we would consider that this would be high risk from an intervention point of view. Other things in terms of this, uh, these cartoons of which you see here, our wires could enter the false lumen. We can cause our genetic dissections as we're ballooning or with our guide catheters. 
they could be stent under expansion of us not appreciating the size. And then for sure, the concept of pushing that hematoma and propagating the SCAD as a result of our intervention are all things that put uh, uh, this as, as a higher risk procedure. In terms of longer outcomes from CAN-SCAD, uh, between one month and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, one month and long-term, uh, uh, in-hospital and long, uh, one month outcomes, there's not a lot of change in terms of maze, but the majority of events do occur early. Um, so again, having that patient in the hospital for an extra few days is important because if there are recurrence of symptoms, um, it would usually occur early. In terms of prognosis, I'm not going to get into the specifics of this as this will be uh, discussed by uh, one of the following talks. Um, but I'm going to come back to our patient. So this is a patient, again, not typical. She's not uh, as young as, as some of our, our patients where the light bulb goes off and says that this is high likely of SCAD. She did have some risk factors um, and her DCGs were subtle at the time. So unfortunately, I am not going to be able to show you what happened here. Oh, actually here. So. Um, again, that left main had now had involvement with the LED coming back here. And unfortunately, oh, let's see if this works. What I did was I was able to wire that artery um, after several attempts, and that just with the wiring alone, it restored flow. And I was able to get a wire across the lesion and at least kept the lesion open with a wire. Uh, and at that point, because that this was a um, involvement of the left main and there was also involvement of the osteo LED and circumflex, um, I discussed it with the surgeon and we ended up sending the patient to surgery. Uh, she actually had a great outcome where she was in the hospital for less than a week after surgery. Um, and has done quite well afterwards. So in summary, um, we do need to develop that early suspicion and recognition of possible SCAD before we even bring the patient to the cath lab. We always have to think about the earlier the cath, the potential of us switching management and avoiding further complications with iatrogenic uh, interventions. Um, conservative therapy should be the default for the majority of patients with SCAD, and that PCI success in SCAD patients are much lower than what we're used to in traditional OACS coronary cases, and that um, CABIS should be uh, uh, considered in these patients with left main lesions, especially with involvement of the proxy and circumflex. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. So this was a wonderful overview. Uh, I specifically like your point about considering SCAD before the patient is ever on the table and some of the early findings, even before you find a SCAD, that may lead you to take greater care. I thought there was a, a, a excellent points that I hadn't thought about before. So thanks very much. We'll save questions for you to the end of the panel. And then we'll move on to our next uh, talk, will be by Dr. Emily Paquin. She is um, a Women's Heart Health Fellow here at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. And over the past year and a half, has had the opportunity to really build her experience uh, in seeing lots and lots and lots of SCAD patients. So she'll be talking to us today about SCAD medical treatment. Now that Dr. So has taught us how to make a diagnosis and who to revascularize, we have to move on to how are we going to treat all of these patients after they're out of the cath lab. So she's going to talk about medical treatment, prognosis, and recurrence. Thank you, Dr. Pakeng. Thank you very much, and thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity to present about a topic that I'm also very passionate about, um, So, which is uh, spontaneous coronary artery dissection. Um, so first of all, I have no conflict of interest uh, to disclose. Um, so the way I, I present medical treatment to patients with SCAD in the clinic is that I usually separate it into three categories. The first one being uh, medical treatment that start getting prevention of recurrence of SCAD. The second category being treating the consequences of the myocardial infarction that occurred. And then the, th the third category, um, targeting uh, control of the symptoms that follow uh, SCAD. 
So if we go first with prevention of recurrence, um, there are three main lines of treatment that are targeting prevention of recurrence of SCAD being antiplatelet therapy, beta blockers, and treatment of hypertension. If we look at antiplatelet therapy uh, first, uh, it's important to remember that when there has been revascularization, uh, antiplatelet therapy should follow the, um, the guideline recommendations or the recommendations from the um, invasive cardiologist and most often uh, will include uh, lifelong aspirin and um, double antiplatelet therapy for about a year or so. Um, however, when, the, when we uh, use conservative management, which is a strategy um, that is being uh, favored in most cases, as Dr. Su mentioned, um, we are starting to question more and more the rationale of using um, anticoagulation and antiplatelet agents, uh, considering the pathophysiological process that is inherent to, uh, to SCAD. Um, therefore, um, be, due to the risk of further accentuating the bleed that's occurring in the in in the media and then uh, further extending the dissection, um, it is recommended to consider discontinuation of anticoagulation once the diagnosis of SCAD is made. Um, but also, we are questioning the use of antiplatelet therapy more and more. Um, as well. Um, there is a lack of data demonstrating benefit of antiplatelet therapy in SCAD to say that there's um, not really any data supporting its benefit. Um, there is also the theoretical risk for extension of the intramural uh, hemorrhage. Um, and SCAD is rarely associated with intracoronary thrombus as opposed to what we see with atherosclerotic um, plaque rupture. Um, and lastly, there are significant um, uh, adverse um, risk um, with antiplatelet therapy, such as increased risk of bleeding in general and development of peptic, peptic ulcer disease. Uh, and therefore, it's suggested to consider reducing the intensity and duration of antiplatelet therapy. Um, there has been recent data published from the International Disco SCAD Registry where they uh, retrospectively evaluated patients who had been treated with double antiplatelet therapy compared to patients who had been treated with single antiplatelet therapy in the context of SCAD. Um, and what they observed was that in patients with single antiplatelet therapy, most of them being on aspirin, there was actually less major adverse cardiovascular events, less reinfarction, and less urgent uh, PC. And in their model, when they looked for risks, um, associ risk factors associated with recurrence of SCAD, the double antiplatelet therapy seemed to be the strongest predictor of recurrence in this observational study. Um, so it remains non-randomized data subject to potential confounders that could have been missed. But in any case, it is uh, quite reassuring that um, there does not seem to be increased adverse events for those patients who were only treated with one single antiplatelet uh, therapy. Um, so now if we look at the latest state of the art review published in Jack 2020, um, we are it's suggested more to use personalized care when uh, when uh, when prescribing antiplatelet therapy, considering the bleeding risk and especially in these young women who suffer from SCAD, uh, some of them go on and suffer from very uh, debilitating menorrhagia. Um, to also take into consideration other indications for antiplatelet therapy and to follow up on the tolerance of this uh, medication. Um, Long-term low-dose aspirin could be considered if there is demonstration of atherosclerosis in another vascular bed, um, and it could also be reasonable in patients with fibromuscular dysplasia, as suggested by the international consensus on fibromuscular dysplasia, where they suggest the use of uh, long-term low-dose aspirin, that it could be reasonable for patients with FMD to prevent thrombotic and thromboembolic complications that we sometimes see with this disease. Otherwise, uh, the latest state-of-the-art review suggests the use of double antiplatelet therapy to be considered for two to four weeks post-MI and to consider low-dose aspirin for three to 12 months or indefinitely. But they also mentioned that it could be reasonable to consider aspirin alone or no antiplatelet therapy. Now, if we go uh, towards our second agent, um, aiming prevention of recurrence of SCAD, 
the only data supporting its use to prevent uh, recurrence of SCAD comes from the Vancouver SCAD registry by uh, Jacqueline Sayal that included 327 patients published in 2017. And when she looked at factors that were associated with recurrence of SCAD, the two main factors that she found were the use of beta blockers and hypertension. And the use of beta blockers seemed to provide a significant protective effect of lowering the risk of recurrence by about 70%, which is um, uh, which is not benign. However, this remains observational data, still again subject to potential missing confounders. Um, and there, to this date, there has not been another study to support these findings. If we look at the more recent data from the Canadian SCAD registry, uh, published in 2022, um, the beta blockers were not demonstrated to be predictors of overall MACE in that cohort. So there is limited data to support the use of beta blockers, but there is still a theoretical benefit of decreasing vascular shear stress, which could potentially contribute to the pathophysiology of SCAD. Um, therefore, beta blockers can be reasonable when tolerated to prevent recurrence of SCAD, but still keeping in mind that tolerance in younger women can be uh, more challenging, especially regarding um, the, the fatigue that beta blockers can cause and also the low blood pressure and low heart rate that we can sometimes find in that population. Um, there is also the, um, the question of whether beta blockers could contribute to vasospasm. Um, Dr. Tweet will be discussing later on about recurrent chest pain post CAD, but one of the theory that could explain why this occurs is that is a possible vasospastic response post CAD, and then whether these beta blockers can contribute to it uh, remains a, a question to be uh, studied more. Um, thankfully, there's a randomized con there's a randomized trial that is undergoing at the moment, the BA SCAD uh, trial, which um, is going to provide us with more uh, useful information regarding the role of beta blockers and anti-platelet anti therapy in SCAD. This study will use a factorial two by two design and aiming is aiming to recruit 600 patients who will be uh, randomized to use versus not of beta blockers for SCAD, and then short duration versus prolonged duration of double antiplatelet therapy. Um, and finally, the third line um, of treatment for prevention of recurrence is treatment of hypertension. As I've mentioned before, um, it came out as a, as a risk factor for recurrence of SCAD. It's also a comorbidity that we found to be uh, more pre prevalent in the, in the SCAD community. Um, and also, in theory, it makes sense that uh, having high blood pressure on fragile vessels could contribute to the physiology of SCAD. So options to consider for treatment of hypertension are the beta blockers for their potential preventive effect on recurrence. ACE inhibitors can also be considered uh, in these uh, patients who've had a recent MI, although while being careful in women of reproductive age. And calcium channel blockers could also be considered, especially considering their potential and angina benefit. Um, what about statins? Um, so there was a study that was published uh, um, uh, earlier on, I'm sorry, I, oh yes, here, in 2012, um, where they reported 87 SCAD cases from the Olmsted County uh, Registry, and they found that in patients who had recurrence of SCAD, there seemed to be a higher proportion of patients who were taking statins. So there was a question whether statins could contribute to the risk of recurrent SCAD. However, it was quite a small sample of patients um, with other uh, differences in patients uh, between patients who were prescribed statins and patients who were not, and missing information regarding later prescription of statins post-hospitalization. Um, these data were not reproduced in the Vancouver or Canadian SCAD registry either. Um, therefore, the current recommendation is to consider prescription of statins only if there are other indications for it, um, and indications can be found in the dyslipidemia guidelines. Um, so that was for prevention of recurrence of SCAD. Now, if we go to uh, the second main category of medical treatment for SCAD, the consequences of myocardial infarction. Well, because SCAD causes a myocardial infarction and can reduce the um, LVEF, the systolic function, well, it is recommended to follow the uh, guideline uh, directed medical therapy and to optimize treatment as fast as possible to, opt to, um, to favor uh, positive 
in these patients. And such therapy includes the use of ARNI or ACE, ARB, um, uh, ACE inhibitor and ARB, uh, the use of beta blockers, MRAs, and SGLT2 inhibitors uh, following the, uh, the guidelines. And then lastly, uh, regarding symptom control, um, uh, as we know, patients who develop SCAD, there's a, a large proportion of these patients who will go on and have uh, persistent and new symptoms following their SCAD. Uh, as shown here in the Canadian Skin Registry, about 50% of these patients go on and have recurrent chest pain post-SCAD. Um, there's also a significant proportion who remains dyspneic after their event, who suffer from palpitations. And I would add to this list also the uh, prevalence of anxiety, mood disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, fear of exercise and fatigue that we can find in this population. Um, some of these symptoms will be discussed later in this workshop. Um, however, uh, if we look at palpitations, there hasn't been any um, any data evaluating the treatment of palpitations post SCAD. Uh, what we do in the clinic is we mostly use either beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or afabrazine to try and treat these palpitations. And it seems to be related to a hyperadrenergic response or a sort of sensitivity to adrenergy that we. Um, that these patients seem to report. Um, there's also a lot of fatigue that seems to accompany SCAD, um, and we've had quite a few cases where simply by discontinuing the beta blocker, the level of energy was significantly improved in these patients. Um, so while we are waiting for more data to support the benefit of beta blockers on preventing recurrence of SCAD, it's something to consider to improve uh, these women's quality of life. Um, and I wanted to present all of these symptoms here uh, surrounding the patient with SCAD just to put the emphasis um, that these um, uh, that um, that uh, the patients, it takes a whole team to help these patients recover from SCAD um, and uh, that um, by working as a team, that's how we can um, provide the best uh, prognosis and, and be best prognosis and best outcomes for these patients. And this is without mentioning all of the other factors that affect these patients' lives that are interrelated and just showing you how uh, the cardiac rehab team is essential in these patients. And I would like also to bring emphasis on the side effects of the treatment that we give that can have impact on these other factors as well. Um, we've mentioned fatigue in patients treated with beta blockers, and we've mentioned also significant bleeding, menorrhagia with patients who are on antiplatelet therapy, um, uh, and as well um, the potential impact of antianginal on women who suffer from, from migraines um, is another uh, example of that. So now what about prognosis and recurrence? So first of all, regarding symptoms, because we've just talked about them. Uh, the good news is that symptoms do improve over time. Looking back at the Canadian SCAD registry, we can see that the proportion of patients who become asymptomatic post-SCAD increases with time, and as well the proportion of patients with uh, chest pain post-SCAD decreases significantly in time, and this is what we usually explain um, to patients, is, is also that time will also bring its own benefit in most cases. Now, if we look at in-hospital and short-term prognosis, um, as mentioned previously by Dr. So, the, um, the overall in-hospital major adverse events rate is about 8.8% in this cohort. Um, and if we look at overall MACE, um, they, most of them seem to occur within 14 days of this CAD, so uh, an important proportion occurring during hospitalization and in the two weeks that, um, that follow the event. Um, the um, the recurrence of SCAD, the, re the reported recurrence rate varies a lot from one study to the other. This is taken from the state-of-the-art review published in 2020, where uh, we can see that the recurrence rate um, varies from 5 to 30 percent, and studies had different definitions for diagnosing recurrence of SCAD, and the duration of follow-up also varied significantly, but overall a recurrence rate of 2 to 3 percent per year was reported. If we look at the data from the latest registry, which is the uh, Canadian SCAD registry, um, the 
rec the rate of recurrence of SCAD was only 2.4% at three years in this cohort. And extension of the same uh, of SCAD in the same vessel um, was of 3.5% at three years. Um, so it seems to be a lower number than previously reported. Um, could this be uh, could this be because of increased treatment with beta blockers, um, increased treatment uh, and support by the cardiac rehab team? Um, this will need a further investigating investigation to um, to be known. Um, and the overall risk of maze that was reported in this uh, registry was about 14% uh, overall, including recurrent myocardial infarction. Some of these women um, will not necessarily have a recurrent SCAD, but may have a recurrent MENOCA. We have a few of these patients um, in the clinic um, and development of heart failure and stroke uh, or other maze that were uh, included in, in this number. Uh, one thing that I think is important to keep in mind is that um, there's also a significant uh, amount of patients with recurrent chest pain post-CAD, and it, it led to visit to ER and admission for chest pain in, uh, in about 20% um, 20 uh, 20 ER visit and 7% admission for chest pain in this cohort, which is a significant number and possibly something that we could um, improve our way of management. Uh, in the outpatient clinic um, and our, uh, in terms of treatment, follow-up, and investigation. Um, so factors that were associated with recurrent SCAD in the literature included beta blockers as possibly protecti protective, a diagnosis of hypertension, fibromuscular dysplasia, significant coronary tortuosity, and migraines. And factors that were associated with MACE in the Canadian SCAD registry included genetic disorders, peripartum status, and extra coronary fib fibromuscular dysplasia, and medication was not predictive of overall MACE um, in this cohort. Uh, so to conclude, um, there is overall a lack of randomized data to support current medical treatment that we use in SCAD. There is a big question mark regarding the use of antiplatelet therapy in patients who are treated conservatively. Um, we could, there is a recommendation for beta blockers given the, the potential uh, very favorable benefit uh, in preventing recurrence of SCAD and the uh, treatment of hypertension, which can be beneficial um, on many other different aspects. Um, there remains therapeutic challenges related to the SCAD population. They are uh, young women who have who may have um, more difficult drug uh, tolerance to drug they have uh, other comorbidities uh, like uh, migraines for instance that can be affected by treatment and the peripartum status is also another uh, significant therapeutic challenge in this population um, there is a relatively low risk of SCAD recurrence, however, uh, with a significant risk of ER visit and a hospital readmission for chest pain, which is something that I think uh, we need to, to tackle to, um, and that we can probably do a bit better in that area. So thank you very much, um, and I'll welcome uh, any question at the end. Thank you so much, Dr. Pakin, for a comprehensive overview of uh, something that is uh, way more complex than it seems, uh, and uh, and also about the the clarity about the lack of randomized data. And so much of what we do is based on you know what makes sense and and based on observation of data. So definitely a lot to be learned about the medical treatment of SCAD. So thank you very much. And I think you left a great segue into the next talk. And I'd like to welcome our next uh, speaker, Dr. Marisha Tweet. Uh, Dr. Tweet is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science and a cardiologist at the uh, Division of Ischemic Heart Disease uh, within the Mayo Clinic Department of Cardiovascular Medicine in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Tweet and I were fellows in the uh, cardiology fellows at the Mayo Clinic together, and I've been watching her career growth with much pride uh, since I have left Mayo. Uh, a lot of what we quote, quote here today is data from Dr. Tweet, so we're really looking forward to her talk about special considerations after SCAD, especially how to manage hormones in pregnancy, which is very often something that comes up with our patients, and importantly, how to manage that recurrent chest pain that occurs so often in this population. Welcome, Dr. Tweet. <laughs> 
Thank you, um, Dr. Cotino, for the invitation uh, to be here. It's my pleasure to be talking today, and I've also really enjoyed listening to all the speakers and learning from you all so far, so I appreciate it. Uh, can you see my slides okay? Yes. Wonderful. So these are, when I saw the title, I saw, okay, there's three things that we really have to address, so I'll do my best to do that in 20 minutes here, but we're going to talk about special considerations. Um, first, though, I, I do have an NHL BI K23 Career Award to study uh, SCAD, so we're about to start enrollment for a prospective study looking at neurovascular function among SCAD patients. I have no other disclosures to report. Um, I think by now everybody is well versed in what SCAD is, so I'll keep this brief, but we all know it's an etiology of acute coronary syndrome due to hematoma or tear, mostly occurs in women. Um, can be associated with pregnancy. And if you look at all pregnancy-related heart attacks, it's one of the most common causes. This is just an example of a 40-year-old female with heart attack. And the reason why I'm showing you this is on the left, the diagnosis of SCAD is not obvious. With the intracoronary imaging, as I already discussed, uh, you can see the hematoma. And so this is just pointing out with the yellow arrow, uh, intracoronary hematoma related to SCAD. And so with the advances in the cath lab, with increased recognition, with patient advocacy, our awareness and recognition and ability to diagnose SCAD has improved substantially. And even if you do a PubMed search, this is a search I did today, I put spontaneous coronary artery dissection to look to see how many articles are, are written or tagged with this topic. And you can see even over the course of the past 10 years, there's been a dramatic increase in publications related to SCAD. Um, and these pub two publications were already uh, brought to our attention, but really uh, these are consensus documents uh, from 2018, which feels like yesterday, but it's already 2023. Um, these documents I still refer to mostly because of the lack of data that's already been mentioned. These are consensus documents where a lot of minds came together and you know created the documents for areas where maybe there's gray zones or not a lot of data. Now, I will mention since these were published, there have been some additional publications which have continued to inform our practice. So the three topics that I was given, I'm going to address with three patient cases. So the first patient is a 44-year-old female. She came in with an ST elevation myocardial infarction and severe SCAD. She had SCAD involving her left main artery, her LAD. She had branch occlusion of the diagonal, as well as SCAD involving her circumflex artery with occlusion. She was essentially in cardiogenic shock, required additional support. Her EF was measuring at 20% and went to emergency bypass surgery. Um, her, her hospital, of course, was complicated by a clot in the left ventricular apex as well. Uh, she was treated medically, actually did rather well, started on anticoagulation because of the clot on the left ventricle, participated and completed in cardiac rehabilitation, has since gone back to work and follows in the outpatient clinic and really has gradually recovered. Uh, we've you know, adjusted her medications and her ejection fraction has improved to 48%. Well, during all this, she's struggled a lot with the menorrhagia while on anticoagulation and has had some anemia. So her gynecologist reached out to me and said, look, we're trying to treat her. Can we start her on progesterone? What do I say? Hmm. Well, let's take a pause and think about hormones and SCAD. And um, there's not much data out there. It's a confusing topic. If you take any woman at any point in her life, her hormones, you know, could be and, and uh, you know, in so many places, you know, even over the course of a month. Um, so when we think about SCAD, we do notice, as Dr. Cotino had already told us, SCAD affects mostly women. It is associated with pregnancy, most often postpartum, which is when those hormones rapidly decline. Um, there is a subgroup of women who have this catamenial angina. So, and usually the timing is actually one to two days before the onset of menses, which is when the estrogen and progesterone levels decline. Um, so clearly there's some kind of hormonal thing going on, just even thinking about those points. Um, when we look closer at estrogen and progesterone, you know, they can affect ligand, ligand activated transcription factors in the coronary arteries. Estrogen activates the endothelial nitric oxide synthetase, producing nitric oxide and coronary visodilatation. It has some other roles that are potentially beneficial. There's some thought that progesterone may counteract that, but you know, really understanding those mechanisms is, is difficult. But there are articles about um, hormonal um, withdrawal affecting migraines, coronary visospasm, and you wonder about, okay, is there a role in regards to SCAD? So as already mentioned by Dr. Cotino, and, and we actually discussed this a little bit on this viewpoint that we published in 2018 or 19 was 
is some of the issue, not so much by the presence of hormones or an excess of hormones, but is it more of a withdrawal or an abrupt change? And I think as uh, Dr. Cotino already mentioned her thoughts on this, I would agree fully that we need to really think through this a lot more carefully. Um, right now, if you look at the consensus documents, and I'll go over this a little more detail, we dissuade exogenous hormones in part because we don't know exactly, and we know there is a sex hormone component. And even when we think about pregnancy, um, it can happen during pregnancy when the hormone levels are still high. So I, I don't think we have fully flushed it out. And I can tell you it's difficult, even just with retrospective data where you may have, you know, where a woman may be in their menstrual cycle at the time of SCAD, it's, it's very difficult because um, a lot of patients are kind of at different points. Um, so let's talk about hormones for menopausal symptoms, because this comes up quite a bit. Um, safety is not well studied or understood. Um, risk may actually differ based on the type, the dose, duration, route of administration, timing of initiation, whether or not progesterone is used um, in terms of, you know, when, you know, as we go through time, the formulations of our estrogens and progesterone, they're also changing. So you may have an older study that used an or older formulation. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why it's so tricky is there's so many variations of what can be given. Um, I will mention when we think about uh, postmenopausal hormone therapy compared to the levels of hormones used for contraception, there are much lower levels of estrogen and progesterone. So we do take that into account. And so if I have a patient with mild symptoms um, in practice, usually we try to use lifestyle changes, non-hormonal options and topical treatments uh, to treat those symptoms. However, if that's not doing the trick or you have a patient with severe symptoms, then we discuss further and many times with our menopause clinic, if it's, for example, someone who has extreme hot flashes, uh, what the lowest effective dose of hormone therapy could be, um, whether or not we could get away with topical or transdermal formulations as those would generally be preferred. Um, but there are many further considerations we need to take into account. We need to consider benefits versus harms. For example, uh, for patients with early onset menopause, there's a lot of data suggesting there's benefit to replace hormones for multiple reasons and multiple organ benefit. Um, so in those situations in a patient with SCAD who has early menopause, um, we may need to be a lot more thoughtful about um, banning them fully from exogenous hormone therapy. There may actually be more benefit than harm. Um, I generally in practice avoid dramatic changes in doses. This is mostly based on my experience and observations with other patients. Um, and I generally prefer if a patient is coming off hormones to wean um, rather than stop unless they're already on a very tiny dose. Um, what about contraception? So currently, and again, some of this I take from the consensus document because of the lack of data, um, but preferred methods, um, both in the consensus document, but also in my practice or when patients are seeking uh, uh, input uh, or their physicians are seeking input, we usually generally prefer uh, IUD with local progestin like uh, Mirena, uh, tubal ligation or partner vasectomy. Um, certainly we try to avoid, but if there are no other feasible options, so systemic um, contraception has been used for some of our patients when we weigh the pros and cons um, or um, other options like NuvaRing. Okay, so what about abnormal uterine bleeding? Well, the first thing I always do in these situations is can the culprit medication be stopped? Because many times um, the menorrhagia is much worse or becomes a problem when a woman is put on dulemic therapy or anticoagulation. So usually the first thing to ask, which was already alluded to, is do they really need this, especially in patients who were perhaps conservatively treated SCAD, but the dual antiplatelet therapy was continued. Um, there's a good possibility that you could stop the Plavix and that will already improve the problem. Um, otherwise, if that's not an option or there's menorrhagia despite that, um, progesterone eluding IUDs can be an option. Endometrial ablation is also an option for unstable or severe bleeding. Short-term cyclic oral progestin treatment has been considered for some patients, and we don't see this often, but in acute situations, balloon tamponade is a strategy used. So let's talk back to our patient number one. Um, she could not stop the anticoagulation. Actually, she got a few months out from her um, heart attack, and with the recovery of her EF, she was taken off of anticoagulation, but then on follow-up imaging, her thrombus had reformed, so she was restarted on anticoagulation, and as a result, continued to have heavy bleeding. She did not tolerate IUD in the past, so currently, um, discussion is underway about low-dose progestin versus endometrial ablation and, and what she would prefer, and essentially the knowns and unknowns.
Okay, so this is patient number two. This is a 32 year old female, no past medical history, um, no past pregnancies. Uh, she presented with an ST elevation myocardial infarction secondary to an LAD SCAD, no clear um, trigger, so to speak. Um, that was over a year ago prior to the visit I'm, I'm discussing now. She had no arteriopathy elsewhere, so did not have fiber muscular dysplasia or aneurysms or dissections. Um, but she did have a transmural apical infarct as shown in the MRI here. So essentially um, the heart muscle should be black on that left ventricle that I'm showing you. And the uh, orange arrows are showing an area of transmural infarct where the contrast, the gadolinium is pretty much hung up in areas of fibrosis. Um, her ejection fraction globally though over time did return to normal. So she asks in clinic, can I get pregnant? I wanna start a family. I just got married not that long ago. This is a dream of ours. So how do you respond? Ah, so the first thing I think about, and this has been discussed, is that pregnancy-associated SCAD patients do present uh, very severely. It, this is really an important cause of pregnancy-associated myocardial infarction, cardiac arrest, severe presentation. This has been shown by our group, but other groups as well. STEMI, proximal and multiple dissection vessel, uh, vessels involved in the dissection, left main, a uh, low ejection fraction, more likely these patients have cardiogenic shock. Um, and, and so when we think about pregnancy, especially in a patient who's already had SCAD, and you're thinking about, okay, risk of another SCAD in the postpartum period, this is kind of where my mind goes, like, oh boy. Um, and when we think about when it most commonly occurs, as mentioned already, and this has been found by our group, but other groups as well, it is usually in that first month postpartum, commonly even within that first week. There is not much data out there though, because I just mentioned you, okay, we don't like pregnancy associated SCAD, but the patient I'm talking to you about didn't have a pregnancy associated SCAD. And she had a SCAD at a young age and wants to start a family. So what is the data out there? Um, so there are four papers on this topic that I could find to date. Um, two of them are from our institution, and then uh, one is from Kaiser and one is from the European group. And I'll just summarize them here in the interest of time. So. Taking all those papers together, there were a total of 59 women who had pregnancy after SCAD. Um, most of these women tolerated their pregnancies and even lactation after SCAD, and there were no deaths. So that's good news. However, within 12 months of delivery, each study reported recurrent SCAD MI. So the first one I'll focus on is a study by our group where it was 23 women. One in those 23 women had a recurrent SCAD in that first year. She was at nine weeks postpartum. It was multi-vessel SCAD involving the left main. She needed emergency bypass surgery. It was a big event for her. It took a long time for her to recover. She since is doing well. She's several years out now and is doing fine and recovered from that, uh, but certainly um, a life-threatening event. Um, in the European group, three out of the 28 women, um, so about 11% had another SCAD within a year. And one, in the eight, one of eight women in the Kaiser group had another SCAD within 12 months of delivery. Um, so you could look at this two ways. You could say, wow, that's great news. Not everybody had a SCAD after their pregnancy or during their pregnancy. Okay, um, that's good news. The not so good news is it's not risk-free. So it really has to do with um, patient preferences, talking with them about the knowns and unknowns, the data, and maybe more so the lack of data. And we have to be careful even with this data. Uh, there's a selection bias, there's a small number total of women, so I mean less than 60 essentially, and there are a lot of unmeasured confounders. For example, um, when we think about pregnancy after any kind of heart attack, um, ejection fraction is one of the most important prognostic factors. So in our Mayo study, all of those women by the time of pregnancy had recovered their ejection fraction to normal or at least near normal. Um, so as you might imagine, the, the risk of a woman after SCAD having pregnancy who is an ejection fraction of 30% will be different than someone who is an ejection fraction of 55% um, when we think about all risk. Um, I don't know if that it necessarily affects risk of recurrence, um, but other concerning factors in terms of how they'll do. So the question really being, <laughs> should women be given the green light for pregnancy after SCAD? So my practice, and this is my practice, not everyone may do this, but um, this aligns with the current consensus as well, is to dissuade pregnancy because SCAD is associated with pregnancy in the postpartum status. Pregnancy associated SCAD has been shown to be severe by multiple groups. Following an initial SCAD 
episode, um, patients may have baseline left ventricular dysfunction or arrhythmias or require cardiovascular medications. Um, recurrent SCAD has been observed in patients with pregnancy after SCAD, although not everybody, which again aligns with this is a multifactorial process. Um, predictors for recurrent SCAD, however, are not well distinguished. There are some things coming out of the literature as we've had you know, just presented to us, um, but you, we're not very good at saying, okay, your risk of another SCAD for this individual is this versus another individual is something else. Um, preventative therapies for recurrent SCAD are not well known. You know, there's some signal in that past paper about beta blockers, um, but again, we don't have foolproof strategies to prevent it from coming again. Um, but it is important to honestly discuss the data, the lack of data, the knowns, the unknowns with the patient. Um, and for some patients, when putting that all into the context of what they want in life and quality of life. And, and I often encouraged that these patients, when we have these discussions, also have their partner present. So it's a group discussion. Um, you know, what's next? So if your patient is contemplating pregnancy or maybe already pregnant, it might not even be an intentional pregnancy, um, what do we do next? So we usually have the multidisciplinary pregnancy heart team be involved. Up front is the cardiologist and the maternal fetal medicine specialist. Um, and then later on, if the patient proceeds with uh, the pregnancy um, and gets close to delivery, we'll involve um, anesthesia as well. We do an individualized risk assessment, counseling, and care plan. Uh, it's always important to confirm the details of a SCAD. So if this is a patient who had SCAD elsewhere, important to see the angiograms and all of that information to really understand, as well as understand their arteriopathy status. So do they have brain aneurysm? Do they have FMD ulcer? That's very important to know. Um, know where they are now. So evaluate their current cardiac function, symptoms, and medications. That may include an echo stress study. It might even include assessing the coronary anatomy, depending on what their SCAD looked like. Um, commonly, we will continue aspirin and a beta blocker through pregnancy. Um, there are certain beta blockers that are better than others. For example, you know, we don't use a tenolol a whole lot for SCAD, but that would be transitioned to something else. Um, we think about timing. So I prefer if a patient's going to proceed with any pregnancy after any kind of heart attack to wait at least one year. Um, and then delivery. So mode and timing is per standard obstetric indications, but we generally prefer uh, it to occur at a level four maternal care facility. So any cardiac emergencies can be um, treated right there. Uh, we tend to prefer planned vaginal delivery with neuroaxial anesthesia, and then C-sections are for standard OB indications. So back to our patient number two. Um, we went through the preconceptual counseling. She went with myself as well as maternal fetal medicine. Um, she had time to process. We really discussed pros and cons and what the plan would be if she decided to proceed. Um, several months later, uh, she did proceed to become pregnant and had a successful pregnancy with delivery without complications. And as far as I know, is continuing to do well in follow-up. All right, so let's talk about patient number three. So patient number three is a 56-year-old female of my, uh, patient of mine. Um, she had a history of non-STEMI secondary to SCAD. Um, it was LAD SCAD. She had a stent placed her LAD. This was about seven years um, before this current visit that we're re reviewing. Um, she's had intermittent chest pain through the years off and on, um, managed by calcium channel blockers, but she tends to have a low blood pressure, so it doesn't always stay on it. Um, but, you know, that past year, she's had two episodes of severe chest discomfort, and the most recent one scared her. She thought she was having another heart attack, and she actually had a brief moment of loss of consciousness. Um, at that time, she was actually in church, so she was brought to the ER. Um, at that time, she had a normal ECG negative troponins times three was sent out. And the question was, okay, they ruled out a new heart attack, but what do we do now? You know, she's had these two very severe chest episodes, discomfort episodes to the point where she thought she was having another heart attack. And they're very scary. And, and what does this mean? So let's think about the etiologies of chest pain after SCAD. So the first thing that we like to be sure of is, okay, is it a recurrent heart attack, which could be from SCAD or something else, whether it be spasm or instant thrombosis, um, uh, and we also, in patients with stents like this individual, I think about instant restenosis. Um, we think about coronary spasm, kind of this endothelial dysfunction and or microvascular dysfunction. Um, and there's also things like pericarditis or pleuritis, chest wall pain, which could be musculoskeletal, costochondritis, or even part of a chronic pain syndrome like fibromyalgia. I also think a lot about GERD, and uh, for a lot of patients, it has a, a distinct burning sensation, but not always. 
Um, so especially with new medications or even chronic aspirin, um, that's important to ensure is not the culprit or at least playing a role. Uh, I do think some patients have symptoms related to PTSD. You know, the brain-body connection is significant. And for some patients, having a heart attack with no risk factors out of the blue is quite traumatic and a lot to process. And the body does have a component of memory. Um, and, and as part of that, kind of this hypersensitivity. So twinges and symptoms that maybe an individual wouldn't have felt in the past, they're now feeling. Um, but also early after SCAD, we've had patients have recurrent pain. We take them back to the cath lab and it's actually extension of their SCAD. So, you know, um, about one in six patients who are conservatively managed will have worsening of the SCAD before it improves in that first week. Uh, you know, always important to look at the stents. You know, there's concern for instant thr uh, thrombosis early on for some patients. Um, and then We've had patients who early on have a lot of pain. And in fact, I think in my clinical practice in the first year, it's about half patients. And I feel like those first three months are really tough. Um, but really, for many people, it, it takes at least a year to kind of get back to feeling to some kind of baseline. Um, but there are patients we've brought back to the cath lab. And despite having a lot more symptoms, their arteries look better. <laughs> so... Um, what that etiology of that may be, I sometimes wonder if it's actually the process of healing is bringing on symptoms or if there's a component of spasm that's coming along with that. Um, and in that AHA consensus document, I won't go into the great detail, but I just want to make you aware there is kind of a nice algorithm to think through if you have a patient presenting with symptoms, kind of what the next steps could be to consider. Um, and really, you want to do the medications based on the underlying cause. So if there's angina, we think about antianginals. If you think this is GERD, treat with those medications. If you think there's a component of inflammation, like pericarditis, and inflammatories, and I found colchicine to be quite useful as well, especially if we were trying to limit inside use. Um, and then pain management. So long-acting medications, SSRIs, you know, medications like Lyrica or topical treatments. For some of my patients who are really struggling and we've ruled out ischemia with um, imaging or stress testing. Um, sometimes a pain rehab program is helpful in conjunction with cardiac rehab or after. Okay, so with this patient, number three, we ruled out a new heart attack. You know, I had her come to clinic, I reviewed her history again, performed an exam, made sure that the pain wasn't reproducible or there wasn't, you know, another etiology that was non-cardiac. We reviewed her medications again. We talked about a stress study and uh, she actually had a stress study probably about a year and a half prior to this. It was a little ischemic in a septal segment where she has known pinching from the stent. Um, but we just decided at this point to proceed with the coronary angiogram and also decided at that point that if that looked reassuring to go ahead and include acetylcholine uh, testing, just considering how significant her symptoms were. Um, and then also still considering the non-cardiac causes, because for some of my patients, it's multifactorial. Uh, so this was her coronary angiogram, and uh, essentially looks pretty good. There is, for those of you who are, you know, can see it, there's pinching at the proximal septal branch, which has always been there, and has been a cause of like, some exertional angina that she's had chronically. But essentially, um, there is nothing that was new compared to, you know, a, a calf from a couple of years ago. Um, so we went ahead and did acetylcholine testing, and we actually found that she has prone to spasm, but she also had abnormal coronary flow reserve. So she, she had evidence of endothelial dysfunction and the uh, reduced coronary flow reserve. And, and when she was given the acetylcholine, her LED, so this is where the flow wire is, but essentially um, her LED completely spasmed on itself, and she did not have any distal flow towards the, the highest dose of acetylcholine, which after uh, intracoronary nitroglycerin then nicely opened up again. Um, so we decided to up titrate her anti angel medications. I started renolazine for her. She has actually responded to that in the past. Um, when it comes to spasm, and she did respond to the nitrates, um, nitrates like imdur, isocerbo dinitrate, um, even sublingual nitroglycerin would be my first choice, but she also has a history significant for migraines <laughs> and was not so keen on that, has struggled with that in the past along with blood pressure issues. I also tend to like calcium channel blockers for spasm, um, but again, she had run into issues with hy symptomatic hypotension. So that's why we ended up going with renolazine with PRN nitroglycerin. Um, and she had some triggers that she could identify. So we discussed trying to avoid those triggers as well. Um, when we think about triggers, 
you know, I compare it to food allergies. You know, if, if you know something brings on angina, well, even if it's stress, which, you know, increases your blood pressure and your heart rate, um, you know, you want to avoid it if you can. Um, sometimes it's not avoidable. So in summary, um, SCAD has a hormonal component, as we I think we all can be convinced of, but it's complex. It's difficult to study well. Um, there is minimal data out there. So a lot of what we um, share with patients is consensus-based or, or personal preference or kind of experiential based on what we've seen other patients do or what is out there in the data, which isn't much, but there is some evidence out there that we can go off of. Um, we do try to minimize the use of systemic hormone therapies, but do I do consider it when the benefit outweighs the risk. And, and is this the right thing to do? You know, I think we don't understand the potential risk. I think there's some hesitation. Even if you take SCAD out of the picture, there's pros and cons with hormone therapy. Um, but we might find as we learn more about SCAD that some of our recommendations or how we approach this can evolve and change just like it has with the antiplatelet therapy. Um, I generally dissuade pregnancy, but there are strategies to support women. And again, as we learn more about SCAD, we might adjust how we approach this topic um, and even study it. And then, as mentioned, we do need to work up and treat chest pain. It may be cardiac, and it's important to rule out any new acute coronary syndrome because, as we've seen, um, recurrent MI can occur. Uh, but also, many times, it is non-cardiac or multifactorial, so it can be complex. So in my mind, you eliminate the, the scary things, and then you work your way down. And also, uh, for a lot of my patients who have kind of chronic chest pain where um, sometimes I hear, you know, I don't even know when to press the panic button anymore. It is challenging. Um, so then, you know, we do the workup, but if we kind of rule out anything scary and we say, okay, we know what this chest pain is, or, or we know that it isn't a new heart attack, let's try to manage it. But the time to, again, seek attention is if it's any different in terms of the quality. So it's a new chest pain or pressure, because it's not always a pain. Um, the sense of doom, you know, it's feeling like another heart attack. You know, you have to kind of trust your intuition when it comes to that. Or it's just becoming more and more severe. And then the other thing I discussed with patients is, yes, coronary vasospasm can be very atypical. It can be brought on by stress, for example, um, which could happen at rest. But also when we're thinking about patients who have stents, for example, um, just counseling about chronic angina. So if a patient is exerting themselves, they're bringing on the symptoms they, they stop and it goes away uh, or responds to nitro, for example, um, that should be a clue in, that, okay, maybe something is changing in regards to my coronary anatomy, especially if it starts happening with less and less exertion over time. Um, I thank you for your attention. Again, I'm really happy to have been invited and I've really enjoyed the conference and the session so far. Thank you so much, Dr. Tweet. I really enjoy learning from your experience, which is very interesting to see that even though we're in different countries, we kind of get to the same conclusions simply by the experience of seeing these patients. So it was very interesting. And I think you addressed the top one, two, three, and four things that our patients ask about or are concerned about uh, after a SCAD. So thank you for that. Um, co continuing on with our uh, sequence here, uh, we start to talk a bit more now about the, the, the chronic uh, and post-acute uh, care management of SCAD patients, and that uh, leads us to uh, Ms. Lenny Van Rin, who is one of our wonderful physical therapists here uh, at the Cardiac Rehabilitation Program at the Heart Institute with extensive experience and interest in working with our SCAD patients. Uh, Lenny Van Rin is a physiotherapist, like I mentioned here. She's a certified clinical exercise physiologist and a member of the training and educational working group of our Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance, and she'll be talking to us today about cardiac rehabilitation and exercise advice for our patients with SCAD. Thank you, Lenny. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So um, I'm just going to spend a minute uh, talking about uh, cardiac rehab in general, and then we'll move on to SCAD specific uh, cardiac rehab. And I do have no uh, conflicts or nothing to disclose. What I'd like to talk about today are the benefits of cardiac rehab, uh, highlight the multinational SCAD registry. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the literature review of physical activity and SCAD, and then exercise prescription recommendations in the context of patients with SCAD, uh, barriers to participation. Uh, I'll also include a case study and uh, will lead to a conclusion. <clears throat> 
So first of all, I want to thank Dawn Bailey, who led off our panel today and was a resoundingly endorsing cardiac rehab. So thank you for that, Dawn. Um, the Cochrane Group has reviewed cardiac rehab and examined 63 studies in just under 14,500 participants and found that compared to no exercise controls, cardiac rehab showed a statistically significant reduction in cardiovascular, cardiovascular mortality and risk of repeat hospital admission. Um, Health-related quality of life metrics were significantly improved in the majority of the studies, and the overall benefit appears to persist over time with 21 to 34% reduction in mortality over time. But what do we know about SCAD? Dr. Saw's group published an interesting study looking at cardiac rehabilitation and a multidisciplinary intervention for secondary prevention. And it, she noted that it improves functional capacity, enhances quality of life, improves psychosocial well being in a broad range of cardiovascular disease. Um, it's been well studied over several years, and it is a class one recommendation in multiple guidelines. Uh, Dr. Audrey Chosin Suarez um, studied uh, the multinational registry, and there were surveys sent out between March of 2011 and November of 2019. There were 950 participants in this study. The mean age was approximately 47. Uh, majority of them were women. 77% attended cardiac rehab. About 70% of SCAD patients had greater than or equal to one risk factor. So that's slightly different. We used to think they had no risk factors. In her study, they uh, had high cholesterol, hypertension, or obesity primarily. Um, prior to their SCAD, 48.5% per performed aerobic exercise greater than or equal to three times a week. 32% performed some type of strength training exercise. And 93% of these participants received some type of exercise counseling, uh, including an exercise prescription. The conclusion of the registry showed that we need to guide SCAD patients based on individual assessments, considering baseline physical activity habits, treatment and risk factors, and SCAD specific physical activity guidelines are needed to opt optimize exercise prescription without compromising patient safety. So Vancouver General Hospital has led the way in the assessment of um, these patients. Dr. Jacqueline Saw's group were the first to demonstrate safety in a cardiac rehab setting with SCAD. Patients were assessed at baseline with cardiopulmonary stress tests, body composition, depression scores, and emotional stress. Participants were prescribed 50 to 70% of heart rate reserve and an RPE, a rating of perceived exertion, of 12 to 14, which gradually increased as their aerobic exercise capacity improved. Patients received psychosocial, nutritional, and stress management support, and their fitness level expressed in max VO2 increased by about 18%. This research is now widely quoted, and VGH now has a SCAD specific cardiac rehab program, which uses most of the above guidelines. However, they adjusted the exercise prescription to use 60 to 70% of heart rate reserve based on an entrance stress test and less than 130 millimeters of mercury systolic blood pressure to reduce the arterial shear stress. At mean follow-up at 3.8 years, there was a significant reduction in MACE or major adverse cardiac events, which was re reduced uh, to 4.3% versus 26.2% in patients who underwent SCAD cardiac rehab versus controls. This represents a 22% reduction in MACE. Dr. Marcia Tweet, who we just heard from, from the Mayo Clinic, has published this very clear and helpful guideline in 2021 in the European Society of Cardiology Journal for patients with SCAD and fibromuscular dysplasia. Fibromuscular dysplasia, as has been discussed, affects the artery walls making them either too weak or too stiff. And it is an associated condition with SCAD, also affecting 90% of women and is unknown in its cause. But it may be related to other connective, connective tissue disorders such as Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. 
The goal of the exercise program is to achieve at least 30 to 40 minutes of moderate physical activity five to seven days per week, or a total of 150 minutes per week. In the recommended category, as you can see on this slide in green, is cardiac rehabilitation, moderate aerobic exercise, interval training, not to be confused with high intensity interval training, just a, a sort of back and forth type of training, weight training with low resistance and high repetition. In this paper, they discussed with caution doing endurance aerobic exercise training, muscle building exercises and yoga poses without extreme head and neck positions and recommended to avoid abrupt high intensity exercise, peak weights with prolonged valsalva, contact sports and extreme head positions. So this is applied in to our SCAD population pretty much with or without FMD. Dr. Sharon Hayes has published uh, the uh, AHA scientific statement on SCAD and in her um, closing remarks, she said providers are encouraged to prescribe a prudent approach to physical activity, balancing the known benefits of exercise with the potential risks associated with high levels of exertion or strain. Referral to cardiac rehab is paramount for addressing exercise induced symptoms, providing feedback and individualized fitness needs. Arbitrary heart rate and weightlifting limits can sometimes lead to frustration or fear with unclear benefit both during and after participation. And that was again highlighted by our patient present presenter at the beginning of our panel. Uh, Dr. Eric Van Itterson from the Cleveland Clinic published some exercise guidelines in a European heart journal in November of 2022. And these specify a fit VP formula for exercise prescription. So the, the fit VP formula stands for frequency, intensity, time, type, volume, and progression. As always, he emphasized in this paper uh, the warm the importance of warm up and cool down. In terms of frequency, it was recommended to be greater than three to seven days per week. In terms of intensity, he suggested that the workload and heart rate intensi intensity should be below the first ventilatory threshold on a cardiopulmonary stress test, as opposed to using the 50 to 70% of heart rate reserve recommendation from the Vancouver group. He goes on to explain that exercise training intensity less than uh, the VT1 point is typically considered very low risk for physical and hemodynamic stress. It's well tolerated by traditional cardiac rehab qualifying participants, and it permits patients to set a baseline level of fitness that uh, safely allows for a natural progression in training intensity and duration to occur over the course of multiple months of training intervention. In terms of the time recommendation, not unlike our general recommendations, it, it was greater than 150 minutes per week and uh, working toward a long-term goal of 300 minutes per week. The type of training varies, of course, depending on the available equipment and also the patient's preferences, but aerobic or cardio type of activity is certainly recommended. And in terms of volume and progression, uh, basically he just talked about uh, progressing one variable at a time, whether it was duration, intensity, or frequency, um, but based on their physical condition, their risk level, and of course their familiarity with the exercise, as an example, he suggested, you know, improving the duration of the exercise by one to five minutes every couple of weeks. Dr. Uh, Van Itterson uh, was said to, um, he, as quoted, he said, there is likely a low probability that most post-acute SCAD or aortic dissection patients are able to self-acquire the knowledge, comprehension, and ability to develop a safe exercise prescription that yields improved cardiorespiratory fitness and maintain heart rate and blood pressure control consistent with what would be accomplished in cardiac rehab. In terms of uh, the strength recommendations in this paper from the Cleveland Clinic, um, they didn't get into too much detail with the strength recommendations, but they did uh, specify high loads, um, sorry, high repetitions and lower loads and weight training one to two times per week, but did recommend five things to avoid. And so the five things to avoid are um, avoid loads that require sustained or forceful engagement of the valsava maneuver. Uh, 
Breath holding should always be avoided. Avoid lifting to muscle fatigue or whole body exhaustion. Avoid isometric exercises, for example, body planks, and avoid explosive plyometric movements. I want to turn my attention now to an earlier publication from the Mayo Clinic group that was published in 2016, um, but it showed some very promising results. There were 269 patients uh, attending 76% uh, of cardiac rehab sessions. The average age was uh, 56 plus or minus 10 years. 96% of these patients were women. 82% perceived physical health benefits from cardiac rehab and 75% perceived emotional health benefits. But in the same study, uh, they did look at some of the barriers to participation. In their initial registry, 85 people did not participate. And one of the main reasons women cited for not participating in cardiac rehab was a lack of physician referral. Other barriers to participation included inadequate transportation, no insurance uh, coverage or the costs associated with attending, caregiving or work responsibilities, no energy or lack of motivation, and feeling too ill. And with that, I'd like to focus on a case study that illustrates this patient population. So I'd like to introduce you to Grace. She's a 37-year-old woman who has had her third child. She was previously healthy and a runner who had a family history of hypertension. She has no known connective tissue disorders or fibromuscular dysplasia. Since her baby was born, she's been getting very poor sleep and it's very difficult for her not to lift over 20 pounds since she has a newborn who's in a car seat and a toddler who is still in diapers and needs to be lifted in and out of the car seat and up and down from um, the change table. So I think everyone who has had a child or children can relate to this scenario. She's also under significant financial pressure since her husband's business was drastically affected by COVID and suddenly they went from having a dual uh, income to now living on uh, EI and a little savings. Her extended family, unfortunately, lives far, far away. So in terms of her cardiac rehab involvement, um, Grace attended the virtual cardiac rehab program, mostly because she was challenged to come to our on-site program because of the travel costs, specifically the costs of gas prices and parking. She was able to do the virtual cardiac rehab program, but she still had to juggle caring for her children while she was on the virtual calls. And she liked having access to the health library, um, which she was able to access at, on her own time in the evenings. She was able to access material about stress management and managing anxiety, et cetera. For exercise, she mainly um, was limited to walking in her neighborhood with her baby and her toddler and their dog. And uh, two days a week, she was able to do some lightweight training. So for this lady, in terms of her exercise prescription, we prescribed uh, 30 minutes of walking five days per week, two non-consecutive days per week of strength training using five to seven pounds and doing free weights. She was asked to do 10 to 15 repetitions and two to three sets at an RPE of 11 to 13, so feels light to moderate. There's a little space in her life right now for running at the moment. Um, she would usually have a gym membership, but the costs are too high for her at this time. She's interested in speaking to other people with a similar condition. So she was a participant in the Women at Heart SCAD support group, which it, you'll hear about more from uh, Helen Robert, who present at the end of today's panel. Um, but unfortunately, she wasn't able to make space to speak with our psychologist, which would have been very beneficial. Grace's situation shows one of the challenges with the weight recommendations since she really cannot avoid uh, lifting over to 20 pounds with her two children. She also is a typical SCAD patient in the in the um, aspect of trying to prioritize herself over the needs of all of the other demands of her time and energy. And I think uh, she also had a significant fear or respect uh, with res with when it comes to exercise. Um, so hopefully her contacts in the virtual care program were helpful in terms of ameliorating some of the fear that she had with respect to exercise. So in conclusion, um, while further research is needed, 
We've learned a lot more about SCAD in the past five to 10 years, as Dr. Tweet pointed out. Um, it appears that cardiac rehab is beneficial in the SCAD population, and we now have much clearer guidelines for exercise prescription. Barriers to participation continue to be an issue, as, and specifically um, the physician referral. And I hope that this presentation is useful to you as a healthcare provider or also a, a patient with SCAD. Uh, I hope that, that the information was helpful. And I know we're gonna save our questions to the end, but I just wanna take this opportunity to say that the path forward involves participation in research, partnerships, national and international cooperation, and education of patients, healthcare providers, and medical practitioners. We look for new innovations and increased treatment options. And I'm very excited about the work that is being done by the Canadian Women's Heart Health Centre and also the uh, Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance. So thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you so much, Lenny. This was a wonderful overview. And just yesterday I had a SCAD patient in clinic who was, she's, years post-CAD and despite doing cardiac rehab, still very fearful of exercise. So we had a long, long talk about all of the things that you mentioned today uh, so she can be more confident. This is such a common topic that comes up with a patient. So thank you very much for your expertise. Uh, continuing with the post-acute care patients with SCAD, many of our patients find themselves with significant mental health issues, anxiety, depression, sometimes even full-blown PTSD. And I think it's very clear to all of us who care for these patients that mental health care is an integral part of the care of a uh, SCAD patient after their event. So it is truly my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Heather Tullock. She's a psychologist and clinician scientist uh, here uh, at the Heart Institute and has a direct clinical and academic interest uh, in a SCAD patients. She is uh, co-chair of our Patient Partnership Council and director of Cardiovascular Health Psychology Lab here at the Heart Institute. She's an associate professor in the Faculty of Medicine and cross-appointed in the School of Psychology here at the University of Ottawa. She is a member of our Women's Heart Health team, uh, as well as the transplant team in the Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance. Her main research focus is on the development and evaluation of psychosocial interventions to improve mental health, quality of life, and cardiovascular outcomes among cardiac patients and their partners, and she also provides psychological assessment and treatment services to all of our patients with cardiovascular disease and their partners here at the Heart Institute. Dr. Tulek, thank you very much for your expertise today. We look forward to your talk. Thank you. Um, I feel like I, I feel like I'm, everyone else has said it as well, but they, we have a great passion for this area, and, and I do as well. So I'll just jump right into it. Um, first thing to say is, hopefully we'll go, there we go, uh, I have no disclosures, although I do want to say that I've been funded by Heart and Stroke and CRHR to do some of the studies that I'll talk about uh, in this talk today. So I'm going to go backwards. It's been mentioned a little bit already, uh, but we do know, of course, that there are precipitating emotional distressors, um, and that is one of the things that's coming pre-SCAD. And up to 67%, now there's a huge range here. Over the studies, it's everything from five to 67% have said there's an emotional stressor. So uh, we can't, you know, we can't say for sure, but we certainly know that this is something that we often see and more so in the women who have had a SCAD than men. Um, we also know that patients with SCAD are more likely to have an emotional stressor than those who did not have a SCAD. So someone that's come in, um, with an atherotic uh, type of MI. We also know that pre-SCAD, uh, a number of these patients do have a psychiatric history. So they may have a history of depression or anxiety um, that's often reported. And again, there's quite a bit of variability in what percent across the studies. And part of this is, is due to the reporting. Um, part of this later will be due to how the questions are asked or the measures that are used. But certainly we do know that it's there. Uh, the rates, of course, are higher for women than for men. And that's not surprising. That's the way it is in the general population as well. So certainly, you know, if we talk about uh, depression or anxiety in the general population, women have higher rates than do men. Um, we also know that rates or we're, we're seeing that over some of the studies that rates are of depression, and anxiety or having just a psychiatric history in the past is higher among those who've had a SCAD than those who are not. Um, and uh, one of the studies says it's like 52% versus, you know, 1.5%. Uh, 
usually I would say for the ACS, that's more an atherosclerotic type. Um, usually I'd say more around 10 to 15, 10 to 25%. Um, but still, we're still seeing quite a difference between those that have had a SCAD and those that haven't. So um, to learn a little bit more of, of how they're feeling post-SCAD, uh, there's a couple qualitative studies that have sort of just talked to patients to see what their experience is like. So the first one I'll talk to you about is one that we did in my lab, so here in Canada. Um, and Karen Bouchard is a postdoctoral fellow working with me and she, along with uh, a research associate that works with me as well, Catherine Lalonde, did a number of interviews with patients. In our first study, it was just 15 patients from Ottawa. But what they told us was, you know, they're navigating uncertainty. And part of that is because, as you've heard many times today, we're really learning as we go, right? And so that thing, the information changes. And initially, especially ones that happened more than five years ago, we really didn't know as much as we do now. And as you saw with Dr. Tweet had that, you know, there's that exponential increase in, um, in studies. And so that's the case, or that the patients are experiencing that. They talk about living with anxiety. Uh, they talk about sort of reconciling their pre and post SCAD identity. So many of them will say, you know, I was healthy before I was exercising all the time. I was sort of juggling many things, taking care of my kids, going to work. And now I am a heart patient. And that's difficult for them to sort of switch that, that identity for themselves. They talk about a sense of isolation. And it's not meaning that they're necessarily alone. It more means in their care. Many people, you know, well, either their age don't have a heart condition. Um, or if they go to, you know, some of our programs and they're put in the more general groups, they will say, okay, well, they don't get it. I remember one patient saying, you know, I was just resentful because I was listening to these patients saying they were, you know, they're retired and they're going to go golfing um, after the cardiac rehab class. And I had to, you know, juggle my kids and work and et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's sort of an isolation within the heart issue. Um, they also talk about managing family dynamics. And I'm sure, you know, that's obviously part of their age. Um, and I do see this in, you know, all cardiac patients that are younger. It is something that's on their mind. And then the second one I want to tell you about is uh, a study that was done with, uh, now I'm forgetting the number, I think it was about 20 patients um, in Australia. And they also asked patients sort of about their experience. And you will not be surprised to hear a number of the words that they use to describe their experience. Shock, disbelief, confusion, uncertainty, fear, anxiety, vulnerability, um, depression, loss, guilt, um, and also invalidation and embarrassment. And, you know, you heard Dawn talk about that a little bit at the beginning. You know, when patients, this was often happening when they were going to the emergency department and they were sort of embarrassed because like, wait a minute, something's wrong with me. But also having some experience of, of not being validated in some of their symptoms and concerns. So certainly there's been some quantitative studies as well, um, where typically patients are giving questionnaires um, and there's quite a bit of variability again in sort of the rates that are, um, you know, presented in these studies. And part of that, again, is because, you know, there's some that are very small studies. Other times uh, it depends on the type of measure that's used. Nonetheless, we can see that there is quite a bit of distress, uh, whether it be depressed mood, anxiety or trauma. And I will note, and this is a study that Mercia Tweet uh, was involved in, they, they said that the patients had reported, or 82% of the patients reported, that they considered their SCAD event to be a traumatic event. And I have to say that's a word that I use, or that I hear quite frequently. So who's at higher risk? Uh, well, women in general, of course, are higher risk of SCAD, but they're also high risk of having, you know, more uh, emotional difficulties post-SCAD. Those that are peripartum, uh, the younger patients, and much of that, I think, is in sort of juggling all the balls that I was speaking about earlier. Um, if they had a prehistory of psychiatric uh, difficulties, then they're more likely to develop that afterwards. And there was one study um, that was uh, published by Johnson, and of course, it's from Mercia Tweet's group as well in Mayo, uh, showed that lower resistance or resilience scores um, did were, were connected with those that had higher depression scores. So there's some insight there and maybe some things that we might be able to do to help uh, these patients and help them build some of that resilience. 
So the next question is, you know, how are they when we compare them with patients that have had an acute coronary syndrome without SCAD? So those that have maybe had a, a, an MI due to blockages. Well, again, the data are fairly inconclusive. There's only a few studies. Um, the first one here is actually one that we just recently published in CJC. And we showed that those that have SCAD have higher rates of anxiety than do those that do not have SCAD. And we did uh, matching on age and sex. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment. Others have compared the scores and saw that they were fairly comparable. So they were quite equal. And then others, again, another study that um, Marisha Tweet was involved in is they actually reported similar or even better scores. Um, so it's the jury is out, I would say, and uh, this is why we really need to do more research, as Lainey just said. Now, does it get better over time? Well, certainly, I will say that all but one study um, have been cross-sectional, so they've only taken it at one, taken the measures at one time. However, if they do measure the ones that have measured, you know, if they look at the time since event you do see that there's more distress closer to the event, so less than one year from their SCAD. Of that one study, um, what we do see is that there is improvement over time and that by one year, they're actually doing fairly well. Although I will note that about 45% of the SCAD patients that were involved in the study still had high stress at 12 months. So now the next question is, does distress impact their cardiac outcomes? Well, the good news is, is there's been a few studies that have shown that an emotional trigger, so that sort of, you know, that intense emotional trigger before the SCAD is not related to poor outcomes. So that's wonderful. Post-SCAD, though, if we've got new, you know, symptoms, depression or anxiety, we have no clue at this point how that impacts their outcomes. And this is one thing that we're looking at um, in our research. So the results will come, uh, hope sooner than later, but uh, at the moment we don't know. So the next question I thought you might be asking was, you know, does cardiac rehab help? Well, certainly it helps as Lainey pointed out on the exercise and as far as our outcomes, cardiac outcomes that is. And we know that in general, cardiac rehab is great for patients. Um, excuse me, those that have had an osteotic type ACS certainly benefit um, on the mental health perspective. There's only been three small studies, pre-post studies that is, that have looked at cardiac rehab and it has shown, or all three of them shown some modest improvements um, in anxiety, depression, and stress. The largest one, which was done by, uh, in the group of Dr. Saw's group in Vancouver, showed that there were improvements in distress, but not on the measures that were more related to depression and anxiety. Um, and then finally, there was one other study, uh, again, coming out of the Mayo group, showing that um, there were comparable scores for depression, um, but actually slightly higher scores for anxiety between patients that did cardiac rehab versus those that didn't. Now, I don't think that cardiac rehab is increasing the anxiety scores. I think it's just those maybe that it chose to attend um, may have some more anxiety and we're looking for supports in different ways. So I'll just tell you quickly about one study that we just did, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we wanted to know in cardiac rehab because there were no studies that did a pre-post with cardiac rehab. So we want to see, well, first of all, do these patients have higher depression or anxiety scores in cardiac rehab at both the intake or completion as compared to um, an age and sex matched uh, cohort? And do they benefit the same way of, as those sort of non-SCAD counterparts? And so what we found was, or I should probably also say that they completed the hospital anxiety and depression scale before and after cardiac rehab. And what we found was that certainly um, individuals who had a SCAD had higher levels of anxiety than those who did not. And they also had um, higher uh, results or sorry, higher levels of anxiety at the follow-up as well. For depression, they were fairly comparable scores. They were a little bit higher, um, but yet they improved over time. And I think this is actually a little bit easier to see. So you can see that patients who had elevated scores on anxiety, so 50% of SCAD patients at intake had high anxiety, um, as compared to 25% who did not have SCAD. 
And then after uh, cardiac rehab, it went down to 42%. So there's some movement, um, but just not a significant amount. And for depression, they started out fairly similarly, um, a little bit higher actually for those that were non-SCAD. And then um, they actually improved a little bit more, but uh, there was improvement for both groups for depression over time with the cardiac rehab program. So um, this tells us, you know, from this study, and again, it was a small study. It was just sort of our, our you know, opening into this area. Um, so we do know that anxiety is something for both groups of patients um, that is, needs to be, I think, tackled a little bit more within cardiac rehab. Um, the depression did improve, though, which is great news. I still want to say that, uh, you know, even though the anxiety didn't come down, I think it's important for these patients to do cardiac rehab because obviously, as I mentioned, it, it improves their outcomes. And we do see some improvements with um, anxiety and depression. So what other interventions are out there? Certainly we know in the general cardiac rehab or general cardiovascular research that psychological treatments do improve both mental health and cardiac outcomes. Um, but it's really unclear with SCAD. There haven't been any studies that, you know, single that group. And there's only been one intervention for patients with SCAD um, or psychological intervention, that is, um, that has been published. And you'll notice the, the sample size is just seven and you'll see a minus two beside. And I wrote that because um, only five actually completed the, the group. Now, this was an eight week cognitive behavioral based uh, group. Um, where they did scores pre and post. So they had people do measures on anxiety, depression, and also uh, cardiac related quality of life. And what they found was, in fact, from baseline to post treatment, so after the eight weeks, their scores actually went up a little bit. Um, now that's not entirely uncommon because certainly patients, once they dive into things, um, it's sort of in front of their face as it they may have been avoiding before. And so sometimes it will go up. And I am happy to say that those scores did go down by their, their three-month follow-up. Now, the problem is we don't know if those scores went down because just the passage of time or they were involved in other interventions. We don't know. Um, so really, we need more research. So uh, as, as uh, Dr. Catino mentioned, I'm the co-chair of the Patient Partnership Council. And so I'm very... Um, I'm a strong proponent of working together with patients and really asking what they want. So there's a couple studies that have come out that have basically done that, said, you know, what has your experience been and what do you like? So I'm just going to highlight a few things from a study uh, from Tina Pittman Wagers, who is a SCAD survivor and actually trained as a psychologist. And so she did the study and she found that 82% of patients felt that their information was inadequate. So what was given to them by the providers, they thought it was not enough. I'd also like to highlight that 52% said that they got their most helpful information from the internet. So, you know, I will say this study is five years old now. And so certainly, you know, we've, I think, improved in our communication and in our information. But certainly, I, you know, it does concern me. In some ways, I really love that these patients are going to find this information. But the other part of me gets scared because I think there's also a lot of misinformation out there. The other part that I want to highlight is that uh, patients, what they wanted was, actually, before I do the, the circle here, um, I'll note that many patients did participate in things like cardiac rehab, some counseling, stress management, and they found it moderately helpful. And I think part of that is because these programs were general. They were not SCAD specific. And one of the things that I often hear from patients is, I want it to be about, you know, my SCAD experience because I don't relate to the others. So I will say um, what they want then is interventions um, that are led by professionals, uh, both for education and support whether it be online or in person. So over 70% really want that education from professionals. And I'll tell you a few things that we are doing. Then we also, um, part of our study that I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we did was ask them, what, what would you like, you know, if you were gonna design an intervention? And so not surprisingly, they said, you know, we want you to address the unique profile of SCAD in cardiac rehab. 
We also want you to provide, you know, professional psychological support as well as peer support for the anxiety we're experiencing. And we also want more information on SCAD. I think this patient group, um, I've never experienced anyone who've been so hungry for information. The other qualitative study that asked patients about what they wanted um, came out from our colleagues in Scotland. And Dr. Liz Newbeck, who we're collaborating with, um, led this study. And, and you'll, I'll just kind of get you to focus on the last column here for psychosocial support. And what the patients were asking there was for early psychosocial support from cardiac rehab professionals, but also social support. And that could be an online or some sort of interactive groups with others, as well as some longer term support. So that would really sort of get a, you know, a booster shot um, so that they had any current concerns over time. So those uh, studies, you know, have led us into what we're doing now. And we're looking at um, basically a survey that we're giving out to SCAD patients across Canada. And we're trying to um, really find out, fine tune a little bit more from what they've told us in the interviews to a larger group. And now we're looking, looking to recruit about 300 patients with SCAD um, to see what are the areas of concern uh, so that can, we can really develop a targeted intervention. And we are expanding this, um, tracking the trajectory of this distress and their well-being as well over uh, the one year post SCAD. Uh, I, I will say that our real hope is to get a, a patient informed intervention that uh, will really work well for them and help them cope. But before we get there, I'm gonna mention just a few other uh, interventions. One is uh, certainly patients sometimes will have individual psychotherapy or they will see a psychiatrist and or talk to their family doctor about getting pharmacotherapy. So there's about one third that will do that. Um, also in the cardiac rehab study that uh, Lainey was talking about from Jackie Saw Group that came out in 2016, they showed that about one third were referred to social work for some support and about one third went to psychiatry for consultation. At our center, we also have the Women's Heart Clinic Education Group. So this is something that started recently where a professional, uh, one of the multidisciplinary team members come in and gives some information uh, and allows patients to ask questions. I actually did it last night. So we talked about mental health um, and it's not specific to SCAD, but many of the patients uh, have had a SCAD. The other thing that I'll, I'll mention is our SCAD patient guide. Patients are often asking for information. And so Helen, uh, who will be speaking next, actually was really key and instrumental in developing this. And it's available on our uh, website at the Heart Institute if anyone around the world would like to use it. The other thing that we have going are our stress management program, as well as our managing emotion program. Um, now, these two are just part of our clinical programs for all cardiac patients. Um, we have not done a SCAD specific group. Um, the problem is often is we have, don't have enough at one time that are, are you know, close enough to when they had their event. However, we did do one group with SCAD patients uh, combined with a few other what we called our young mums group because it tended to be younger women. Um, and what we found there was they, they really responded well, but they needed more than what was in the general program. And so it was typically a 10 week program and they often had a few more sessions after with, with one of the psychologists. Um, but unfortunately we have no data on that or the stress management. Um, so that's something we'll have to look into. Um, as Dr. Tino mentioned right at the beginning when Dawn was speaking, um, we do have our Healing Hearts Together program. This is not specific to STAD, but it is acknowledging that certainly uh, a cardiac event does not happen to just the patient, but to those around them, and especially a spouse if they are in a partner relationship. And so we developed this program to help couples cope. And so certainly we've had a number of SCAD patients that have participated. Uh, the Women at Heart Support Group, um, again, I'll let Helen speak to that, but uh, we're still waiting for some data. So I guess one of my points here is that we just really need more data to show that these programs are being really helpful. Um, and last to mention, there is a SCAD Warrior app. Um, oh, I'm missing the A there. But uh, this was developed by, or in conjunction, Tina pittman Wagers was one of the main people uh, who I mentioned is that SCAD survivor and psychologist. And it's an app that there's information, there's information, 
sort of sessions where you go through and you talk about your values and meaning, and you do some journaling, um, but there is no data with this either. So we don't know how effective, and at the moment it's actually offline, but it is coming back, she assured me when I spoke to her this week. And the last thing I'll mention um, is exercise is really important for our mental health. And so, you know, obviously there's those guidelines that we want to follow for these patients, as Lainey outlined, but certainly we do encourage patients to get out, you know, get outside, get into green space, because all these things are good for your mood. So I, I, the one thing I didn't say just before I say my take home is, you know, I'm, I was focusing on the stress and certainly that is there, but I also want to highlight there's a number of patients that do well and we want to learn from them as well. And that's something that we are also doing in one of our studies is really looking at sort of building on some of the work that, you know, Mercia's tweet group did when they included um, the, the resilience. But we also want to look at optimism and just general well-being and life satisfaction. So those are some of the other things we want to look at. But certainly distress is there. And we need more data to understand and to really develop some effective interventions. Um, as clinicians, you know, I, I urge you to be really alert to symptoms of anxiety, depression, and trauma, um, and also obviously to refer, uh, if you can, depending on your resources, to things like cardiac rehab, to any of the psychosocial interventions. Um, I often, if we're not able to follow them at the hospital, I have sort of a, a number of people in my back pocket in private practice that I will refer to. Um, that are psychologists that, you know, know our patient population. Certainly peer support is also important and information. Um, so those are my take homes. So I will stop there and just say, you know, we really need to treat the heart, but we also need to nurture the mind. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Tolak. Amazing talk. And we're so happy that you have taken this project on in, in terms of advancing the science, because as you mentioned, uh, a lot to be learned still, but certainly clinically we, we observe the benefits. So it would be great to demonstrate this scientifically. So thanks for your work and for your talk. And I promise to everyone today that we will start and finish uh, with women with lived experience in SCAD today. So we'll now uh, move on to our last talk of the panel, which is by Ms. Uh, Helen Robert. Uh, she's a SCAD survivor, a patient advocate, and a volunteer as a peer support facilitator with the SCAD Women's, Women at Heart Support uh, Group here at the Canadian Women's Heart Health Centre. And as a clinician, I always tell my patients that I can do my very best in terms of being informed on clinical data, new studies, medical management, et cetera, and give that to them as my best advice as a physician. But there's one aspect of the care uh, and the recovery of a SCAD patient that I simply cannot help uh, which is the need for peer and social support, simply based on the fact that I haven't had a SCAD myself. And this is where the peer support groups come in so nicely to really help that aspect of the recovery uh, of our patients. So I'm really excited to have you speak to this, Helen, because you help create the Women at Heart program. And then, of course, the, the SCAD Women at Heart program is, is a Helen project as well. So welcome and thank you very much for, for your expertise today. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Um, okay, let me just share my slides. Perfect. I need something to guide me. Um, so as I said, thank you for having me here today. And I've been, I've learned so much actually, and it just really reminds me how far we've come in the eight years since I had my SCAD. Um, and I'm going to talk about peer support today, but just before we start, um, Going back to Dawn's presentation earlier, Dawn brought up a lot of things, a lot of things that resonated with me as well in her story. Many elements of it are very common. So I just like you all to sit back and imagine for a second, you know, you're in your 40s, running your own company, supporting your family. You have never been in the hospital except for 24 hours to deliver your daughter. Um, you've got low blood pressure perfect cholesterol, healthy weight, you work out four to five times a week. And you wake up on Friday morning, you get your morning coffee, you sit down at your computer and have a heart attack. So what, you know, you go to the hospital and you're accused of first lying about having a Coke habit, um, being told it could not possibly be your heart because you didn't fit the profile. Uh, and then after about five days of 
back and forth and back and forth, uh, and finally being sent for an angiogram, you're told that you have an idiopathic heart attack. So, you know, it, it's shocking. Um, and so just if, just think about that for a minute. If that was you, how would you feel? And we've heard from everybody today, all of the different speakers, they've all brought out different pieces. And I promise I wasn't typing um, during, sorry, I wasn't typing during the, uh, during the sessions today. So these are the things that I've come up with just based on my own experience and doing peer support with probably up in the hundreds of women with SCAD at this point and a couple of men. So when we have SCAD, that shock, disbelief, there's also a denial. A lot of women, when they come to, when they first talk with me, um, they don't accept that they have heart disease. They, they don't believe they're a heart patient. They are finding every which way to explain it differently. Um, they're in a state of shock. They're experiencing extreme fatigue. I know for myself, I was, work, I was sleeping about 22 hours a day. So you're not really at the top of your game at this point. Um, you're experiencing this constant anxiety, right? You feel like you literally have a, 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 a you know, like dynamite embedded in your chest and you're not sure what's gonna check it off, what's gonna happen next. The diagnosis itself, it's called spontaneous. That doesn't instill a lot of confidence in people that it's not gonna happen again. Um, there's so much uncertainty, there's so much unknown. And yet every time, as I was listening today, I was realizing that since I had my SCAD eight years ago and the conversations I've had with Dr. Coutinho, Dr. Pakang, um, over the past, say, five years, has been really interesting. Each time I meet with them, the, the research is changing. And so we have a different conversation. And that's really difficult at the beginning because people want answers. Uh, I talked about the fact that they don't fit that heart disease profile. Um, other people, other presenters have talked about the fact that um, we feel isolated. Dawn brought up, you know, being at cardiac rehab and being the only person basically walking around the track at, at a normal pace, carrying little pink weights. Um, very much can identify with that. And some SCAD patients have told me that they went to cardiac rehab once and didn't feel like they belonged but I'm not hearing that so much anymore, thanks to people like Lainey, who are Dua and Tara Burney out at Vancouver General, who are customizing their programs to support the needs of the SCAD patients. Often we are exercisers. Some of us were runners before or uh, other types of athletes, um, but we have lost confidence in our bodies. That's what Dawn said, and she articulated that so well. So cardiac rehab helps us regain that and learn what our new limits might be in a safe place. Um, and again, I think I can't, I can't reinforce the benefits of cardiac rehab enough um, because it really does give you that confidence back. We have confusion about the medication. Um, as I was listening today to Dr. Packin talk about all of the different medications and how the research is constantly changing and, you know, it's complicated for a medical professional. Imagine what it's like for us. We don't look sick. We didn't get stents, or some of us did, but often, you know, the cons with conservative treatments, we didn't get stents. Uh, so people seem to, they're very understanding at the beginning, but then they're not. So we lose that support, right? That the friends and family, they kind of want to move on. And our families are affected too. So dealing with all of these things, is really challenging. So, so what can peer support offer? I think everybody would, would agree. It provides a connection to other people with similar experiences, which is so important. Um, it provides hope to newer patients. It provides validation of feelings and experience with pe from people who have sort of gone down a similar journey. Uh, it helps us with learning coping skills. Again, sharing experiences, learning from someone who has come before you. And there's also the element of navigational support. So 
who are the SCAD specialists in your city? Um, where, who are the top researchers? Who are the ones to watch? Who are the ones to pay attention to? Um, you know, where can you go? What, what kind of publications are best to read? All those kinds of things you can get from peer support. But we also know, uh, Heather, uh, Dr. Tulloch just mentioned that, you know, we tend to be, and maybe the data is not that clear yet, but in talking to people, the, the traumatic effects seem to be higher in people that I talked to within those first three months. We also know that the Canadian, in the Canadian system right now, um, people are waiting uh, up to four to five months for cardiac rehab. They're waiting nine to 12 months to see a SCAD specialist in Ottawa right now. So, you know, peer support is something that can bridge that gap a little bit and maybe help with some of the basic questions and just get, get people feeling a little bit less lost while they're waiting on these specialist appointments and rehab programs. Um, peer support can also help the individual come to terms with their diagnosis. And in turn, I, I feel, so I have no data in my presentation at all. This is just my own observations. Um, when people come to terms with their diagnosis, they tend to improve their adherence to their medical supports. So whether that is going to cardiac rehab, whether it is doing stress management, um, getting one-to-one -one psychologist support, uh, whether it's their medications, uh, all of those things, if we can get them to come to terms with their diagnosis and get to a level of acceptance, they, I think what I see in people is then they find the strength and they see the value in following through on some of these things. So when we think of peer support, we're often thinking of informal supports, which definitely have some value. But some of this, they're on social media, for example, there are probably close to 100 groups across the world now that are SCAD support groups. And it's great because people are finding that social support, they don't feel as isolated. It's like, oh my goodness, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so glad I found people like me people who understand, which is terrific. And most of the groups are quite supportive. But I also see kind of like an almost dark underbelly. I see there's a risk of harm with some of these groups. So I see inaccurate information being and advice being given to people. Uh, I see medical advice being given to people. Um, I especially see this in some of the U.S. groups where Unfortunately, there is no universal health care, and there people have realities that include not being able to afford medical treatment. And so they literally go on to Facebook support groups for medical advice, um, which is a scary, scary thing. There is sometimes people will breed negativity. Um, and I also see sometimes people are so needing to share their story to people who understand that they are completely unfiltered and they they share some of the traumatic events that happened in a way that someone else might, it might actually hurt someone else by being kind of triggering. So those are some of the things that I worry about a bit with informal peer support, although they do have benefits. You also see community groups or, you know, you meet somebody at a barbecue and they go, oh, you had a sketchy, my sister had that, you should talk to her. That's great, again, for that social support, but, there's still a missing piece. This is where a more formal approach comes into play, which can really help. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the Women at Heart program that we have here at the Heart Institute. And it's actually uh, being offered from the Canadian Women's Heart Health Center now, and it's offered virtually to women across Canada, which is really great. Um, so the Women at Heart program was developed I'm going to say 2015, um, to support women with heart disease. And it's a, it was, it's a 10 session program. It runs just under six months and the women, it's the same group of women through the whole process. So there's a really great opportunity to, for them to really bond, share experiences. Um, it provides informational, emotional and appraisal support. So it really helps them walk through the process of, 
recognizing what happened, uh, working through their emotions, um, building out coping skills, finding resources, learning how to advocate for themselves. All of these things kind of tied up with a bow, so to speak. Um, but what, what I found myself when I did the program, I thought it was an amazing program, but I felt different than all the other people, which some of our presenters have talked about um, hearing from their patients. And talking to other SCAD patients, I heard the same thing. And then we heard about SCAD patients dropping out of women at heart because they didn't feel they belonged. So they weren't getting help. So um, Dr. Coutinho will attest to this. I whined and I whined and I whined for about three years. And eventually we had enough um, we had enough testing of the program itself that we felt comfortable that we could actually customize it for SCAD needs. Then our problem was trying to get enough people uh, to put a group together locally. So we tried going virtual uh, just before COVID hit actually. Um, but so, so we were all set to go when COVID hit but it's customized to SCAD needs. So our facilitators are trained. We've got an extensive training program from the Canadian Women's Heart Health Center. And But all of our information, our, our discussion, everything focuses around SCAD. Our medication discussions, everything is around SCAD. And the story sharing is also very specific because everybody has SCAD. So it's a really... Um, I think it's a really great program. It's not perfect. And, you know, there are many people who need a lot more than this. So this is definitely never going to replace um, professional supports. Um, but I do believe it can bridge the gap uh, and, and help support women who maybe this is all they need to free up our professionals to help the people who really need it most. So I do have a little blue box bullet there or bubble, I guess, about what about the men? And I guess having this opportunity to talk to um, providers, men seem to shrug it off and say they don't need a program, um, but the all three men, so it's not a big, big data sample here, but all of the men that I've spoken to, they are struggling with the same things as the women. And so if you are treating a man with SCAD, um, please don't discount this area of, um, of health, like their mental health is suffering as well. They just may not be as open about sharing it. So the really great thing too, I think about having trained facilitators and a peer support program that is um, connected to an, a healthcare institution like the Heart Institute um, is that these trained facilitators have an impact far beyond just the program that we're delivering. So our program delivers to probably about 10 participants, and I think we're running about three programs a year. But on top of that, we will do in-hospital support before COVID. I know that I have sat with women who have had uh, SCAD when they're in the hospital, they're still reeling from the shock. They don't know what this means. Um, and I've sat with them. We do phone support. We had a call this week, actually, uh, a woman who had gone through our program, actually, her sister was being airlifted in, from St. John's, Newfoundland to Moncton um, for an angiogram and further testing and was beside herself, not listening to her sister. And her sister called and said, could one of our peer facilitators please call her and try to talk her through this? And so a colleague of mine was available and made that phone call. So from Ottawa, we were able to help this woman through this process. Um, in those social media groups, we find ourselves trying to impart the wisdom that we've learned from the professionals into our social media groups to try to you know, mediate them a little bit and, and make sure that people are not necessarily just getting bad advice here, um, suggesting they talk to their cardiologist, suggesting they go to their pharmacist, suggesting they find a, a, a psychologist that is at minimum trauma informed, if not SCAD specialized. Um, you know, and we're also out there building a SCAD community of patients, and that is really valuable as well. 
Uh, the Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance actually has recently uh, launched a uh, peer support directory called the Women's Heart Hub, and it's on the OttawaHeart.ca uh, website. And um, it actually already has quite a few SCAD groups listed, um, social media ones and in-person ones across the country, and they continue to grow. So there's still a lot of room for growth, but it's a starting point. So if you have a patient and you think they might benefit from peer support, you know, feel free to go on to the Women's Heart Hub and or suggest that they do. And they may be able to find a group, either a virtual group through Women at Heart, or maybe there's a local community group that they can join in person as well, depending where they live. So it's something to it's something to realize too that if we could build out these programs nationally or even internationally, um, we can have a much bigger impact than just the 10 people that we see three times a year. And the more of us we are, the more people we can help. I think we have four trained, um, four trained facilitators in SCAD right now. And I just recruited another one last week. So hopefully we'll have five really soon. So the other thing that is really great about this is the collaboration between the peer supporters and the clinicians and researchers um, as well. So I know that we would not be able to do the work that we're doing without the support of doc people like Dr. Catino and Dr. Tulloch and Lainey um, and Dr. Paquin, because I know as part of this program, if I if something comes up in our group, I know that I can reach out touch base and all of them are amazing. They get back to me usually definitely within a couple of hours. Sometimes it's minutes with a quick answer to something that makes a huge difference to the people, the women in my group. And so that being able to do that for us to feedback, um, Heather mentioned earlier, you know, being able to say, hey, but what about this? Or could we do that? Could we do something a little bit different? Because what we're hearing from the women is this. and it's really amazing to be able to have that collaboration and to have clinicians and and who will who are open and and share in sharing ideas and thinking about solutions together. So we truly are better together. And so in conclusion, I would just I would like to suggest that structured peer support can really inherit Blech. encourage better adherence and commitment to recovery. Uh, I think it can provide a safe and supportive space for SCAD patients to feel connected and heard, but the key is that it, they need to have SCAD in common. It can't, they can't just be thrown in with other people with heart disease. Um, they need to feel connected and heard. They need to be able to share their experiences and learn to cope. Uh, we do need more evidence and support needed for both men and women. I think we've heard that from, I think, pretty much every single presenter today. Um, and anecdotally, experientially, I truly believe that peer support can make a difference. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Helen. You are the heart and soul of the Women of Heart program. And I always tell my patients that, you know, learning to navigate life with this burden on your shoulders, which is this history of SCAD, it's something that only the peer support can do. Uh, the, uh, the, it has been demonstrated that the major rehabilitative need of a woman after a heart diagnosis is the need for social support. And this is where the Women at Heart Peer Support Group really mm -hmm. comes uh, to, to fill that, that need. So thank you so much for everyone's attention. I cannot believe that we have just filled three hours of SCAD content. Uh, I don't think I have ever spoken about SCAT for so many hours at length, and it's been really a phenomenal panel of experts here today to really leave no, sterns, no stones unturned. Uh, we are at the end of the hour. If that is okay with everybody, I really would like to take 10 minutes to, to maybe address the audience's questions, if that's okay, because I don't want to finish without uh, doing that. So I'll ask all of our panelists to turn their cameras back on. And I already see there's a question here in the chat by Dr. Habiba Garuba, who's one of our wonderful cardiologists here, who also sees a lot of scanned patients in the Women's Heart Health Center. And she has a question for Dr. Tweet, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for your patient number two, who you were who was considering starting a family, 
What if she was to consider surrogacy instead? What would you advise about the risk of hormonal therapy associated with ovarian stimulation for egg retrieval? Do we have any data? So, uh, Marisa, would you like to address that question from Habiba? Sure, and uh, that's an excellent question, and we've gotten that question before. There is no data. Um, it's it's a tough one because, you know, you go down the whole path of uh the hormonal process for egg retrieval and risk for hyperstimulation of the ovaries and things like that. So um, we don't, we talk to patients about it because at least that way they can forego um, the risk of carrying the pregnancy to term. The main thing that I've run into is the primary issues. It's often cost prohibitive for most patients. So I don't recall if we addressed it specifically with this patient, we may have, but I know another recent patient where it was brought up and she had actually looked into it seriously, but the cost, um, at least here in the States, was much too great for her, um, just from a money perspective. Personally, my concern Marisha, too, we, I think we both touched upon the concept of hormonal withdrawal, uh, and I, w I have this theoretical concern of the hormonal administration uh, for um, ovarian stimulation, and then what happens after the stimulation ends. Uh, and it's a conceptual concern, uh, just based on what we see in some patients. And of course, there is no data, but uh, that's something that I think about uh, as well. So thank you for that answer. There's a question here uh, from Cheryl Martin. Do you foresee a consistent SCAD treatment protocol ever being developed? Um, uh, we have participants here from the US and Canada. Um, great question. Um, the the um, Maybe I'll address this directly. The uh, Obviously we have the consensus statements that were brought on at the very beginning of today's panel. Um, there is some thought about uh, standardizing, at least here at the Heart Institute, uh, we are currently standardizing our diagnostic and, and, and treatment strategies for Minoka, which is another condition that affects women, with the plans to do that next for SCAD. Um, but uh, uh, at, this, at this time, the, the expert consensus statements is what we have uh, to to help guide uh, uh, the practice for everyone. Uh, Marisha, I don't know if you know of anything happening in the U.S. Uh, on a, a more national level for new standards for SCAD? Not at this time, and I think um, to develop confident standards, we need a lot more information yeah. um, and more data to support that. Which, as you mentioned in your slide, it's getting better and better as the years go by. Um, Anybody in, this, in the audience that would like to ask a question, you can also raise your hand uh, and speak directly to your computer microphone, or also feel free to type in uh, the question uh, to, to the panel. And I'll, I'll give the usual uh, awkward 10 seconds of silence here to see if anybody pops in. And not seeing additional questions and also knowing that we are ahead of our uh, scheduled time, I will close our simple our workshop here uh, with a deep, deep thanks to all of our expert panelists. Again, there were no stones left in turn in today's workshop. And I'm really hoping that for all of you in the audience, if you felt that this was a um, sinister diagnosis, this is something that you've heard about once in a lifetime, hopefully you feel a lot more informed now about how to deal with these patients, how to make the diagnosis. And I think I'll speak for our panelists here that if there's any questions from anyone in the audience, feel free to, to reach out to the conference organizers and they can certainly get a hold of us. And we're happy to work with you via email to answer additional questions that may come up as well. So again, thanks everyone for your time and for three hours of solid SCAD information. Wish you all a wonderful rest of the day and thanks for your attention today. Bye everyone.